Welcome to the Just Thinking Podcast with hosts Daryl Harrison and Virgil Walker, bringing you cultural apologetics as well as social issues from a biblical worldview. This is the Just Thinking Podcast. Let's think. (laughs) We are back. It's another edition of the Just Thinking Podcast. I'm glad to be back. I am Virgil Walker. And I am Daryl Harrison. What's going on, Omahe? <laughs> man, it's good to be back, man. Yeah, man, I, I was it feels so good was, to be back. You and I were bouncing off that on that intro music, man, the intro, off the air, man. man. You know, our, our listeners missed out on that because they couldn't see us, man. We we had some, we, we were bouncing, bro. <laughs> I love the intro, man. I I know I know we're, I know we're about, I know things are about to change in a little bit, man. But I I love that intro, man. I know the guys are working behind the scenes to get us something new and updated and fresh for the for the 2021 you know season but man I, I love our intro music it gets me rolling man it's always good to be I, I was I was gonna say on the ones and twos man back back on the microphone oh, man, whoa, whoa, man. Whoa, whoa. hold on hold on a second man did you used to DJ, DJ too did you oh did yeah you to... Bro, what come on man come on man Bro, you already I did not, know I did not know that man I know I know I knew that you knew that I used to DJ back in the day but yeah, I didn't yeah, know yeah. you used yes. to do that what? Yeah, yeah, I used, yeah, I used to DJ weddings and different parties and stuff like that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. What kind of turntable did you? I, I didn't have. I by the time I got in the mix, man, I was all. It was all digital. It was. All, oh. I had laptops oh. and, dig, and digital turntables. So I, I, I was, you know, I was. I, I wasn't old school. So you know. Yeah, I had two. Uh, I may not qualify. I may not qualify. I may not qualify. And we put you a DJ with an asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> Because if you can't spin, bro, I don't know. I don't nah, know if you're gonna nah, do in the nah, club, nah. man. If you can't actually spin them, but nah, uh, man, yeah, nah. man, I had I had two techniques: direct drive turntables, man, with the swerve, uh, with the swerve arm, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, man, it was it was back. That was back in the day, though, man. Don't, don't get me started, bro, because I'll I don't know, man. I don't know what I'll do, man. Talking about yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was that was that was that was that was yeah. So we will bounce into the intro music, man. Man, how you doing, bro? How you doing, man? I'm doing I'm doing great, man. Feeling great, man. A lot of great things happening. Uh, all kinds of stuff, man. I, the big announcement uh, for those who don't know or haven't been been following and maybe hearing for the first time. Um, and, and we talked off air. I told you I'd, I'd probably mention uh, the fact that I am the executive director for G three ministries man i'm pretty excited about that bro as, as I, we 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 were playing around man as soon as you leave atlanta man i go i go i go to atlanta you go right? to atlanta that's how that right 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 that's how that works man so i had to, <laughs> i had to leave atlanta to make room for you to go to atlanta man, so so what what, what do we what do we do now man do we call you mr omaha now is it mr no. with the title executive director of g3 executive ministries director. so you're yeah. going to be reporting directly to our, our good friend our good brother josh bice dr josh yes. bice yes who, man uh, excited who, who, who runs g3 right yes yeah man i'm excited to be working with him and and the, and the host of folks that are part of uh, of g3 ministries man completely honored we've been in conversations you know over the course of the summertime and into the fall and into now and so uh yet yeah, it's it's become official and uh actually man today was the last my last service at my church and so uh man it was a pretty long extended kind of deal and uh we we did we dealt dealt with that today my wife and i enjoyed that time with them and uh kind of wrapping things up as we get prepared for what's next uh, at, at Praise Mill and and there at G3. So we're, we're really excited, man. Well, that's wonderful, man. I know there was one more thing you wanted to mention here at the top, man, before we dive into our topic today. So I want to give you a minute or so to, to mention that as well. I, absolutely, man. Wanted to mention the fact that we are now, you can get uh, this podcast, the Just Thinking Podcast, on AGTV, AGTV, American Gospel Television. Uh, man, if if you're if you haven't checked it out, you need to. You need to go to watchagtv.com. That is watchagtv.com. 
And uh, man, check it out. A lot of great content there. It's like the it's like the you know the, the gospel of Netflix, right? All, all the all the yeah. great speakers, teachers, leaders <clears throat> that you're interested in are all are all there. Their content is there. Um, and if you put in bar and the number one bar one, uh, you can the code bar one. You can get a ten percent off of their of their subscription rate so definitely want to encourage you to do that check out agtv we're excited to be a part of that we're excited to be there man a lot of great things happening for just thinking uh for you and i individually as well man it's been it's been a it's been a crazy year an amazing year and uh, man a lot of a lot of a lot of good things end up coming out of it so yeah i like how you I, i like how you when you're talking about agd agtv you kind of refer to it as the christian netflix and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, it's the Christian Netflix, but without all the hokiness, without the without right, all right. the sappiness, because right. some of the, some of those some of those Christian movies on Netflix, especially now that we're in the Christmas season, you know, we sit here on Sunday, December the seventh. I'm sorry, Sunday, December the sixth, 2020. Right. Sunday, December sixth, 2020, recording this episode. Uh, you know, you go on Netflix right now, seeing all the Christmas movies out there and stuff, man. It's it's, it's just hokey, bro. I mean, it's just yeah. syrupy syrupy yeah. sappy but uh agtv american gospel television is the exact opposite substantive yeah. biblical content uh so please subscribe i think the website is what watch agtv watch agtv yep dot com yep okay yep. watch agtv dot com so but man it's been a while verse since you and i've been together man behind the mic it's been over a, a month and a half uh, Has it been that long, man? Yeah, so we 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 released the our most recent episode, episode one hundred and five. We released the doctrine of elections, uh, right shortly before the end of October. Right. So now right. we That's sit right. here now. Yeah. So we sit here now, December the sixth. Uh, it's been what close to six, seven weeks, close six mm-hmm. weeks. Yeah, six weeks, man, since we've been behind the microphone. So it's good to be back with you, bro. So the topic we're going to be dealing with in this episode, episode one hundred and six of the Just Thinking podcast, we've titled this one, A Biblical Exposition of Unity. Mm-hmm. A Biblical Exposition of Unity. And you know, Verse, there's a lot of talk today, both within the church and without the church about unity, right? Mm-hmm. So some examples, I wanna go through some examples just to kind of make my point about there being a lot of talk today within the church and without the church about unity. Now, some of the examples of that kind of unity talk that I've come across recently, particularly on social media. Let me start with a tweet by Baptist Press, organization called Baptist Press. Mm-hmm. This tweet is dated November 17, 2020. That tweet included a link to an article on the Baptist Press website at baptistpress.com titled, Study, colon, Multiracial Churches Growing, But Racial Unity May Be Elusive. Okay, so that was from Baptist Press in a tweet, November 17, 2020, talking about racial unity. Now, another example is a tweet dated November 7th, 2020, from Dr. Russell Moore, president of the ERLC, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. The tweet from Dr. Moore linked to an article written by Dr. Moore on his own website at russellmoore.com titled, Christians, Let's Pray for President-Elect Joe Biden. Christians, let's pray for President-elect Joe Biden. Now, note in the article, which again, the, the, the article's title, which again is dated November 7, 2020, that Russell Moore referred to Joe Biden as president-elect. Although the Electoral College, which is the entity under the United States Constitution that is solely and expressly responsible for determining who actually is elected president and vice president, had yet to meet to cast its electoral votes which will be on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December. According to the Constitution, the Electoral College meets on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December, which in this case, given that the election, our most recent presidential election was held on November 3rd, that would mean that the Electoral College would meet on Monday, December 14th. But here we have Russell Moore already referring to Joe Biden as president-elect. Now, There's also a tweet by J.D. Greer. J.D. Greer is president of the Southern Baptist Convention, the SBC. This tweet by J.D. Greer was dated November 10th, 2020. That tweet said, quote, Church, let's be united because the gospel we preach is of the greatest importance and the Great Commission is of highest urgency, unquote. 
That was a tweet by J.D. Greer dated November 10th, 2020. Now, that tweet by J.D. Greer linked to an episode of his podcast on his website at jdgreer.com titled, How Are You Processing the Presidential Election? Question mark. Mm -hmm. The podcast episode by J.D. Greer is dated November 9th, 2020. And in the notes describing that episode is this sentence, quote, Pastor J.D. Greer shares three words that should guide our post-election posture, empathy, charity, and unity, unquote. Empathy, charity, and unity, unquote. All right, that was from J.D. Greer, November 10th, 2020. There's also a tweet dated November 7th, 2020, from pastor and author Ray Ortland, Ray Ortland mm-hmm. of Renewal Ministries. In that tweet, Ray Ortland said this, quote, President-elect Biden, you won fair and square. Congratulations. Around half of our nation voted the other way. Remember that, if you will, restrain the extremists in your party and represent the wide consensus of America. You will succeed magnificently. God bless you, unquote. Wow. Okay, so that was from Ray Orton, Ortland in a tweet dated November 7th, 2020. On that same day, November 7th, 2020, Ray Ortland also tweeted this, quote, President Trump, we thank you for all the good you did. We forgive you for all the harm you did. Now it's time to go. Defeat isn't the end of your life. It can be the start of a new life. The reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life quoting Proverbs 22, 4, unquote. That was Ray Orland. Ray Orland sent both those tweets on November 7, 2020. Now, and lastly, there's this tweet dated November 24th, 2020 from actress Alyssa Milano, an avid and some would say rabid supporter of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. In that tweet by Alyssa Milano dated November 4th, 2020, she said this, quote, I'd like to extend an olive branch to Trump supporters. I am ready to move pound, I'm sorry, hashtag forward together. I'm ready to move hashtag forward together. There's so much work to do to heal the nation. Let's be part of the solution and not add to the problems we face. My comments are open. Please reply with hashtag forward together. Then she closes that tweet with a red heart emoji, unquote. Now, Notwithstanding the overtly political tenor and tone of some of the comments I just read, my personal opinion about the political perspective of the individuals I quoted is not the reason why I quoted them. Okay. Mm-hmm. I cited those individuals because, in one way or another, Baptist Press, Russell Moore, JD Greer, Ray Ortland, and Alyssa Milano, and that's just to name a few, are all echoing a call for unity. Okay. Mm-hmm. It just so happens, though, that the timing of their respective petitions for unity was only a few days after a presidential election, the outcome of which, as we record this episode on December 6, 2020, remains to be determined. But again, I just want to make this clear. Politics is not my point of emphasis here. OK, mm-hmm. we already dealt with the politic- political dimensions of the election. We already dealt with that in our previous episode of the Just Thinking Podcast, episode number 105, titled The Doctrine of Elections, which I encourage you to go back and listen to if you've not listened to that episode already. The Doctrine of Elections, that's episode 105. So my goal in this episode here today, which we titled An Exposition of Biblical Unity, is not to retread or retrace ground that we've already covered, okay? However, that said, though, it does need to be stressed that it is against the backdrop of the elections of November 3rd, 2020, that this topic of unity has suddenly come up. And I say suddenly because prior to that date, none of the aforementioned individuals were calling for unity. Not a single one of them. Now add to that the fact that I find it to be both conspicuous and a little bit concerning that of the examples I just gave of evangelical leaders and of other individuals who are calling for unity, none of them bothered to define or contextualize exactly what kind of unity it is they're advocating. 
Now, that is something that should not be overlooked. And I say that as a warning because on its face, right, the idea of unity is such an easy proposition for believers to affirm and support. I mean, after all, who of us doesn't want to be in a state of conciliation with one another? Right. I mean, who does who doesn't want that, right? Right, right, right. That, that, that's that's Romans eight. That's Romans twelve eighteen, mm-hmm. where Paul says, "If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men." But note here that Paul said, "If possible," okay, "if possible," which implies that there will be occasions when it may not be possible to be at peace with all men, mm-hmm. which is all the more reason why I think we would do well to consider what the great Dutch American Calvinist theologian Gerhardus Voss of Princeton Theological Seminary said in his systematic theology titled Biblical Theology, Old and New Testaments, concerning the impetus for seeking unity on the part of the people whom God dealt with at the Tower of Babel. Listen to this from Gerhardus Voss from his systematic theology titled Biblical Theology, Old and New Testaments, talking about the motive of those individuals at the Tower of Babel. Quote, the building of a city and tower was inspired first by the desire to obtain a center of unity, Mm -hmm. such as would keep the human race together. But the securing of this unity was by no means the ultimate purpose of effort. This unity was to afford the possibility for founding a gigantic empire, glorifying man, in his independence from God, unquote. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Glorifying man in his independence from God, unquote. There was Gerhardus Voss from his biblical theology, Old New Testaments. Now, what Gerhardus Voss described there is precisely what we're seeing today. It's precisely what we're witnessing today, Omaha. So-called progressive politicians and the evangelical leaders who tacitly, if not overtly, support them Mm -hmm. are calling for unity in the context of a kind of secular oneness of humanity toward the goal, as Voss said, to glorify man in his independence from God. Mm -hmm. Now, as Christians, we need to be able to cut through the superficiality of that kind of counterfeit homogeneity in order to see it for what it really is, which is nothing more than humanism. Now, if you're a regular listener to the Justin and Podcast, you are not unfamiliar with how dogmatic Omaha and I have been on this program about the need for Christians to biblically define the terms we use. Mm -hmm. We're we're extremely dogmatic about that. The reason we're so emphatic about that is because, as we've often said, words have meaning. And it is the meaning of words which, for better or worse, establish the context, the context of what is being discussed. That is especially true as we engage in apologetics which is precisely what we do here on the Just Thinking Podcast, okay? But before you not go any further on this matter of unity and what it looks like biblically, anything you want to add uh, to this point, Omaha, to anything that I've said so far? Yeah, I, as I was kind of thinking through the kind of the opening monologue that you kind of walked through, I started, I, I really, you know, oftentimes you'll, you'll send me the notes and say, hey, here's where I'm going, here's kind of where my head's at, and here's what I'm thinking, and it gives me an opportunity to kind of reflect and there are times, man, when, when you cover the ground so well and so succinctly that, that it's really difficult for me to think, okay, where, where could I insert some ideas that were, that kind of differ uh, from where you landed? And so, man, it was, that was definitely the case uh, with the notes that you sent me as we kind of got started. And so as I sat for, it took me a couple of days, I started thinking about all of these people that you mentioned, the names you mentioned. And so I, I, Here's kind of the track that I took, Daryl. I began thinking, uh, in, in light of the calls for unity during this election, I thought to myself, I wonder what these men and women, at, and one, the one woman that you mentioned, were saying on November 8th or 9th of 2016. Right? 2016. Yeah. A so couple this was, days after this the be, election. Just a few days after the election. Yeah. This would be the day or a couple of days after president president elect in that in that instance, president elect Donald Trump was elected as the 45th president of the United States. So it it, it would be true, I, I would I would think that during any election cycle, when two candidates representing two distinct worldviews are clashing, that calls for unity 
and those in that instance would definitely be important. Now, I, I know we're going to address in detail the type of unity that's in view, uh, at least by those who are, are are laying claim to it during this election cycle. However, I was curious as to the nature of the unity being called for during the previous election cycle, and if it was consistent with what we're hearing today. And all I was looking for as I went back was, again, I, and I want to make this point clear, what I was looking for was not, you know, were you for Hillary or against Hillary? Were you right. for Trump or against Trump? I, I didn't, I didn't, that was not in view. All I was looking for in going back and, and, and trying to examine this was consistency in messaging. And, mm-hmm. and that was it. I was curious to see if the messaging with regard to calls for unity were consistent during the election cycle of President Trump as they are with 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 uh, with uh, Biden today. So you mentioned Baptist Press. So the first thing I did was I went back to see what kinds of stories were being covered by Baptist Press during the 2016 election cycle. And under the 2016 uh, election coverage section of Baptist Press, Press, there was an article that was written by Marilyn Stewart titled Seminary Professor on, on Please to Flip Vote. Let me say it again. Seminary Professor reflects on Please to Flip Vote. Now, in this article, Stewart goes on to describe how seminary professor Lloyd Harsh of the of New Orleans uh, Baptist Theological Seminary received more than 90,000 emails from distraught voters regarding the election cycle outcome. Now, this was during the election cycle to, of Donald Trump, right? Mm-hmm. So so for, for, those, for those who recall, and, and you may or may not, Donald Trump had actually won the state of Louisiana. So again, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary is in the state of Louisiana, and the state of Louisiana was carried by Donald Trump by a wide margin. In fact, 58% for Trump, 38% for Clinton. And Louisiana holds eight electoral votes in the Electoral College. However, this article goes on to explain that Louisiana is one of 21 states whose electors are unbound, right? Meaning that they're not constrained legally to vote for their party's nominee. Now, the, the winner of the state, which would be the winner of the state's popular vote, Professor Harsh whose contact information, unfortunately for him, was actually available on the Louisiana GOP website, was easily accessible by those inside and outside of the state at the time of the election. Uh, The article goes on to describe how Professor Harsh received more than 2,000 letters, and some of which actually arrived at his home. I I cannot imagine what what that would have been like for him. So he had 90,000 emails from distraught folks and 2,000 letters that arrived at his home. Home. Let me allow me to quote from the article. Quote, Harsh, Harsh said the emails and letters, some severe, expressed concern regarding President-elect Donald Trump's fitness for office, a fear of foreign interference, and Trump's loss in the national popular poll. Harsh fashioned his response by looking to the Federalist paper number 68, the, quoting, quoting Harsh now. Harsh said this, quote, I determined the electoral college was never designed to be a redo of the election, end quote, Harsh would say. So he, here's what Harsh is, is, is evaluating. Harsh is evaluating. His state voted hands down, I mean, in favor of Donald Trump. And right. what he wanted to report was, was not the idea of unity, but at this point he was trying to examine what his obligations were given the situation as it was. 90,000 people had emailed him, 2,000 letters at his door, He's trying to figure out, do I have to vote for Donald Trump with the electoral vote? Because he was he was selected as an elector for the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. Right. He said this from the nation's beginnings. And I'm, I'm quoting again from the article from the nation's beginnings. Harsh noted electors were chosen based upon their alignment with a particular candidate that and that and that's. And and that going against voters wishes would require extraordinary circumstances, end quote. So, so he, he he recognized, having gone back and looked at federal Federalist Papers, that in order for him to to advocate the the response of 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 this rest of the state, that it would have to be pretty serious circumstances in order for him to do so. Mm-hmm. Now, ultimately, Professor Harsh would stand by his convictions and put his support behind President Trump. However, this was not without studying other alternatives to doing so and making it clear, at least in the Baptist press comments that, that he reported, that he was willing to consider other options. So, so again, I, I, I share this very lengthy, very detailed. I recognize that. But I'm trying to balance that against the calls now for, for, for unity, 
right? right. And, and, and in, in yep. particular, race, racial unity. Let, let me give you another example. I won't be as detailed in these next two examples. I'll cover these quickly. Um, well, this doesn't, again, this doesn't sound much like a call for unity to, to, to me. And, and fairness, however, um, let me walk, walk you back through what Russell Moore, because you mentioned Russell Moore, yep. who, who, who during the time of the 2016 race uh, had, made, had to make amends with key leaders. I don't know if people remember this. He had to make amends with key leaders within the SBC for the comments that he made that seemed to suggest that Trump supporters were a part of an outdated guard who were a part of what he believed to be a problem in politics. So, so Russell Moore had gotten out on his skis a bit and, and really had, had made some pretty harsh statements about Donald Trump and, 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 and by way of, of, uh, of connection, Donald Trump supporters. During the 2016 election cycle, Moore called Trump a, quote, awful candidate, end quote, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. criticized, this is an important part, and criticized the, quote, old guard religious right political establishment supporting him. More, more would go on further by saying, quote, the religious right, listen to this, the religious right turns out to be the people that the religious right warned us about, end quote. Now, th- this doesn't at all sound mm-hmm. like you calls a call for unity. Uh, now, now, mm-hmm. in fairness to, now, in fairness to Russell Moore, a- a- after key leaders within the SBC penned an open letter to Moore, and others, uh, at, you know, there were a number of others who addressed the matter with him privately. Moore did apologize for his comments if those who heard them felt that he had directed his comments toward them. Uh, it, it, would be, it would be later that Moore would call for prayer for the president. However, it wouldn't be difficult to read what Moore felt in the days following the election of 2016. If you were inclined to find out what he felt, all you have to do is go on his website. And, and the calls are very different and right. what he shared was very different than right. than what we're hearing right, right. now. So again, finally and, and very briefly, brother, uh, as for J.D. Greer, his comments aren't difficult to find either. Uh, there was an article that he posted on November 10th, 2016, just days after the election of Donald Trump. And, and we can read what, what Greer was thinking. Now, to his credit, Greer did use the term, the terms empathy charity and unity in the previous election cycle, and as he did in this election cycle. And, and I, I realize in this episode, we're going to examine biblical unity so that so that when whenever we hear calls for unity, we can be sure that they align with scriptural calls for unity or what the scripture has to say about unity. So I'm looking forward to the ground we covered. I just thought to go do some homework to see, again, my whole point in doing so is not to cover the ground with regard to a particular candidate or ground that you and I have covered in a previous episode, but simply to look for consistency. And that was it. Yeah. So you're trying to contrast the 2016 comments that were made in 2016 after the 2016 election. You're just trying to contrast some of those with some of the, 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 the citations and quotations that I read here after the 2020 elections, because what we're trying to do here is establish context. Absolutely. Okay, so you're, you're, you're contrasting that helps us to establish context, Omar. So I, I, I understand exactly why you did that. So and yep. thanks for doing that, by the way. Yeah, let me just yep. say that, you know, in, in, in my opening monologue, Omaha, I talked about the importance that Christians be able to biblically define the terms we use. OK, so we're we're we're, we're fairly dogmatic about that on the Just Thinking podcast. It is vitally important that we apply that precept to the topic we're discussing in this episode of the podcast, which, again, we've titled a biblical exposition of unity. It is vitally important that we define the terms we use biblically. Okay, now I say that in light of these words from the great Welsh theologian D. Martin Lloyd Jones, who in his book titled The Basis of Christian Unity said this quote, No question is receiving so much attention at the present time in all branches and divisions of the Christian church as the question of church unity. It is being written about, talked about, and preached about. Now we all agree, surely, that the Christian church should be one that she was meant by God to be one. And therefore, we must agree further that it is a tragedy that division ever entered into the life of the church. In addition, we must all regard schism as a grievous sin. That is common ground. But having said that, one must also point out that there is obviously great confusion and much disagreement as to what constitutes unity as to what the nature of unity is, and as to how unity is to be obtained and preserved, unquote. Okay, that was D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. 
from his book, The Basis of Christian Unity. Now, the very last sentence of the quote I just read from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones captures the reasons why you and I decided to dedicate an episode of our podcast to the subject of unity, Omaha, because as Lloyd-Jones rightly said, there is, there, there, there is obviously great confusion and much disagreement as to what constitutes unity and, and, to, and to what the nature of unity is and how unity is to be obtained and preserved. He's absolutely right. So it, it is our sincere prayer and desire that by the time we're done with this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast, that much of the confusion and disagreement that exists on what true biblical unity is will be ameliorated. Okay, that's our goal and our prayer here. Now, it is with that goal in mind that I want to begin our discussion by defining biblically what the word unity actually means. What does the word unity actually mean biblically? Okay. Now, when you study the scriptures, what you'll find is that the word unity appears only five times across all 66 books of the Bible. Only five times. Once in the Old Testament and four times in the New Testament. Okay. Those five occurrences are Psalm chapter 133, verse 1, John chapter 17, verse 23, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. Okay, so only five times in the entire Bible do you see the word unity. All right, Psalm 133, 1. John 17, 23, Ephesians 4, 3, and then again, Ephesians 4, 13, and then lastly, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. Now, what's interesting, though, Omaha, is that the four occurrences of the word unity in the New Testament are actually three different Greek words, okay? Three different Greek words for the word unity in the New Testament. Now, I want to take some time because of that, right? I want to take some time to exegete those words in the New Testament, because I think doing so will help establish some much needed context for the discussion we're having on this matter of what biblical unity is and what it isn't. Okay. Now, the first of the aforementioned three Greek words for unity is found in John chapter 17, verse 23, where Jesus is offering what theologians refer to as his high priestly prayer to his heavenly father. So Jesus says this, quote, I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me, unquote. Now, in that verse, the word unity there is the Greek word heis, H-E-I-S, heis, which translated means one as opposed to many in number. Okay, one as opposed to many in number. So the word unity or heis in John 17, 23 is a numerical term, meaning that there is numerically only one church, only one body of believers. Okay, the Apostle Paul affirms that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, where he says this, for even as the body is one, even as the body is one heis, and yet has many members, And all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. That was 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. Now five times in those two verses, the Greek word heis appears. So every time you you heard me say the word one, in reading 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13, that was the Greek word heis, okay, five times. But simply being one body, simply being one body or one church in number doesn't pretend that there is unanimity and agreement within that one body, all right? As the 17th century Puritan Thomas Manton said in a message titled, A Persuasive in Unity to Things Indifferent, A Persuasive in unity to things indifferent. Thomas Manton said this, quote, we have one common God and Father whose eminency is above all creatures, whose presence and powerful providence runneth through all creatures. But his special presence by the gracious operations of his Holy Spirit is in the regenerate, 
Surely this is a strong bond of union to be one in God. He is the common father of all believers through Jesus Christ. Some are weak, some are strong, some rich, some poor, but they have all an equal interest in God. Now for us, who are so many ways one, to be rent in pieces, how sad is that? All these places and many more show how every Christian should, as far as it is, as it is possible, be an esteemer and promoter of unity among brethren, and not only to make conscious of purity, but of unity also, which, next to purity, is the great badge of Christianity, unquote. So that was Thomas Manton, from a persuasive in unity to things indifferent. So Thomas Manton there is using the word unity in the context of the Greek word heis, that we are one body, we are one church as opposed to many, okay? Now, the second of the three Greek words for unity in the New Testament is found in two verses in Ephesians chapter 4. First, there is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, where the Apostle Paul exhorts believers to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, that's Ephesians 4, 3. Second is Ephesians 4, verse 13, where Paul states the goal and purpose of the exhortation which he gave in Ephesians 4, 3. So Ephesians 4, 13, Paul says, until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to be uh, uh, to the measure and the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, the word unity in those two verses, okay, is the Greek feminine noun, henotes. Henotes, that's spelled H-E-N-O-T-E-S, henotes, which translated means unanimity or agreement, okay? So, just to review, the Greek word heis in John 17, 23 is a numerical word for unity, okay? But in Ephesians 4, 3, and, and then again in verse 13 of Ephesians 4, the Greek word for unity is the word henotes, which translated means unanimity or agreement. We're going to come back to that in just a second. Now, lastly, the last of the three Greek words in the New Testament for unity is found in the Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. And the word unity in that verse is the Greek masculine noun syndesmos, syndesmos, S-Y-N-D-E-S-M-O-S, -S, syndesmos, Colossians 3, 14. That word there, syndesmos for unity, translated, denotes that which binds together. It's speaking of the ligaments by which the members of the human body are united together, or joined together, okay? Now that we took the time to unpack the word unity as it appears in Scripture is an example of why we describe the Just Thinking podcast as an expository podcast, okay? Because we take the time on this podcast to exposit text, to exegete terms within the text so that the context of what we're discussing can be better and more clearly understood. Now here we have one word, unity, that has three distinct definitions in the New Testament. Now you'd never realize that unless you're applying an expository lens to your study of God's word, which is what we do here on the Just Thinking Podcast, Omaha. We apply an expository lens, an exegetical lens to the biblical text. Now, having said that, of the three aforementioned definitions of the Greek word unity, the one I want to land on in terms of our discussion of biblical unity is the one that is found in verses 3 and 13 of Ephesians chapter 4. That's the word henotes, henotes, which means unanimity or agreement. Now, my reasoning for focusing on that Greek word henotes is that those two verses, Ephesians 4.3 and Ephesians 4.13, contain two very important prepositional phrases that will help us establish and understand what kind of unity it is that believers in Christ, both individually and collectively as one body, are specifically to pursue, okay? The prepositional phrases that I'm speaking of are the phrase unity of the Spirit in Ephesians 4.3 and unity of the faith in Ephesians 4.13. Those two prepositional phrases are crucial to our conversation on this topic because, as D. Martin Lowe-Jones Jess Jones says again, quoting from his book, The Basis of Christian Unity, uh, Martin Lowe-Jones said this, quote, the ultimate question facing us these days 
is whether our faith is in men and their power to organize or in the truth of God in, Je in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me put it another way. Are we primarily concerned about the size of the church or the purity of the church, both in doctrine and in life, unquote? That was D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, again, from his book, The Basis of Christian Unity. So Lloyd-Jones poses to us, Omaha, what is the fundamental question that we have to consider? And that question is this. Are we primarily concerned about the size of the church or mm -hmm. the purity of the church, both in doctrine mm -hmm. and in life? You see, there's a doctrine through which the issue of unity must be understood and applied by the evangelical church. That's good. Unity, unity that is pursued outside of the doctrinal parameters of the spirit and of the faith, anything that's that so-called unity that is outside of those parameters from a doctrinal standpoint is to be avoided mm -hmm. at all costs avoided at all costs by those who pr profess to be followers of Jesus Christ. Any, any thoughts on what I said at this point, Omaha? No, there's a lot of thoughts. I mean, uh, again, th this is what we do on the Just Thinking podcast. I mean, we, we want to walk through the scripture. We want to examine what's there. I, re I remember when you first talked about this, when, you know, this was weeks ago as when, when we were together. I, I can't remember if we were, I think we were together in, um, were we in Missouri? We were, I, th I think we were, where were we, I think bro? So. I, I think we were either in, uh, we were in Missouri. I think you're right. We, we've been all over yeah. the place. Yeah. 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 I think we were in Missouri when you, when you were, had just started talking about this and talking about what, what you were hearing, which were these, these constant calls for unity. And you, you had examined the text and, and said, wait a minute, man, when, when I see unity, there's a specific thing that scripture intends mm -hmm. with yep. regard to that. So we, we have to be careful of, of how we're unifying, with whom we're unifying, with the purpose by which we're unifying. And so you constantly kept kind of beating that drum. And I thought, man, I, I wonder where he's going to go with this. I mean, I, I really wonder where, you know, th does, is, is there a whole show in this? It's yeah, kind of what right. I was initially thinking. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, I, yeah. I thought, okay, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about unity, and we can talk about that. I mean, is is there is there enough for? You know, we we do we do long form, so I know I know with right. you and me, it's it's an hour and a half, two and a half hours, maybe. Yeah. You know, just until yeah. until we get done. So I, I thought about that, and then when you unpacked kind of the the five um, key texts of scripture that included unity, um, I, I thought, wow, okay, that there's there's something there. Uh, you mentioned the, the the where the verses where we had the word unity. You mentioned Psalm one thirty three one, John seventeen twenty three, Ephesians four three, Ephesians four thirteen, and Colossians three fourteen. And my goal as you kind of walk through this because this is all exegesis. This is what we do. This is the this is the yeah, meat and potatoes this, behind what we do. This is how we roll, bro. Yeah, this is the meat and potatoes behind what we do. So I really didn't want it. I I did not position a ton of commentary in this space because I really want you to kind of continue the thought process. But but of those of, of, of the passages in my that, that my mind immediately went to when you began to talk about this, it was John 17, right? With yeah. with the high priestly prayer of, of, of mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in that text, and I know you're going to unpack that a little bit later, that we have Jesus praying for unity or the oneness of believers as he asked the Father to sanctify us by the truth in verse 17 of chapter 17 mm -hmm. in John. Uh, so when I think about unity, unity is always established on the basis of truth, which truth is, is on the basis of God's word. I know we're going to unpack that to greater depth. And so I'm not going to try to steal any, any thunder. I just, as you were commenting about that, and I thought about that and, and, and uh, kind of was listening to you, my mind immediately went to John 17 and, and, and really kind of unpacking the high priestly prayer. And, 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 and that's kind of where, where it went, but man, keep, keep, keep rolling through what you got going. Yeah, let's do that, man. Let's keep rolling. Um, in his sermon titled The Importance of Small Things in Religion, okay, The Importance of Small Things in Religion, which he preached on April 8th, 1860, the great Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon, whom I'm going to cite often in this episode. Let me just give our listeners a heads up. You're going to hear a lot of Spurgeon from me in this episode. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said in his sermon, The Importance of Small Things in Religion, quote, it is not likely that we should all see eye to eye. You cannot make a dozen watches all tick to the same time, much less make a dozen men all think the same thoughts. But still, if we should all bow our thoughts to that one written word and would own no authority but the Bible, the church could not be divided and could not be cut in pieces as she is now. 
unquote. Now, Spurgeon said those words back in 1860, okay? 1860, he said that if we would just bow our thoughts to that one written word, to your point earlier, Omaha, what Jesus said in John 17, that your word is truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This is essentially what Spurgeon is saying here. If we should all bow our thoughts to that one written word and would own no authority but the Bible, the church could not be divided and could not be cut in pieces as she now is. Now, conversely to what Spurgeon uh, just said, conversely, the beloved uh, British theologian J.C. Ryle in a message titled Pharisees and Sadducees, Pharisees and Sadducees, J.C. Ryle said this, quote, to keep the gospel truth in the church is even of greater importance than to keep peace. Did you hear that, listeners? Okay, this is J.C. JC Ryle dropping the mic. He said to keep gospel truth in the church is even of greater importance than to keep peace. The Apostle Paul valued unity very greatly, as we know. Why? Because he dreaded false doctrine. He feared the loss of truth more than the loss of peace. Many people have a morbid fear of controversy. I love that Ryle said that. He said many people have a morbid fear of controversy. They would have said with Ahab that Elijah was a disturber of the peace. They would have thought that Paul at Antioch went too far. To maintain truth in the church, men should be ready to make any sacrifice, to hazard peace, to risk dissension. They should no more tolerate false doctrine than they would tolerate sin. Peace without truth. Listen, I'm still quoting J.C. Drow here, folks. Drow said, peace without truth is a false peace. It is the very peace of the devil. Unity without the gospel is a worthless unity. It is the very unity of hell, Drow says. Still quoting Drow. Let us never be ensnared by those who speak kindly of it. False doctrine and heresy are even worse than schism. But what is schism? Is it not false doctrine that rends the body of Christ? Or can the body of Christ be rent? If people separate themselves from teaching which is positively false and unscriptural, they ought to be praised rather than reproved. In such cases, separation is a virtue rather than a sin, he is the schismatic who causes the schism. Unity, quiet, order, give beauty, strength, and efficiency to the cause of Christ. But even gold can be bought too dear. Unity, Rao says, and he closes with this, unity which is obtained by the sacrifice of truth is worth nothing. It is not the unity that pleases God. Unquote. That was J.C. Ryle again from a paper he wrote titled Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, intrinsic to those words from the great J.C. Ryle is the question that every believer should consider when it comes to this matter of unity. And that question is this. What is the unity that pleases God? What is the unity that pleases God? The unity that pleases God is unanimity and agreement that is, remember those prepositional phrases that I cited earlier, right? The unity that pleases God is unity that is of the faith and of the spirit. In other words, it is a unity that is solely in accordance with the word of God and only that which is in accordance with the word of God. As J.C. Ralph said, peace without truth is a false peace. It is the very peace of the devil, Ralph said. You see, Omaha, there are people in the church today professing believers who are encouraging and exhorting other believers to embrace a form of unity that is in reality a false peace. They are advocating that believers come alongside and tether themselves to a world, to a culture, and a society that is demonstrably anti-Christ and anti-gospel, all in response to a presidential election in which their seemingly preferred candidate, at least as far as they're concerned, won. Come on, man. Come on, man. Those kind of people are what I call campfire Christians. Okay? I call those folks campfire Christians. Campfire Christians are people who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, but who, under the guise of unity, right, under the pretense of unity, would urge other professing believers to come together, as if we're all gathering around a campfire on a chilly night 
and set aside our biblical orthodoxy for the sake of locking arms and singing campfire songs as a superficial example of what unity is. Okay. In fact, as, as I speak about uh, the so-called campfire Christians, I'm reminded of that old Coca-Cola commercial from the 1970s. You remember that commercial, Omaha, that old Coca-Cola commercial from the 1970s that depicted a group of hippies on a hilltop somewhere in Italy. They were singing, I like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. You, you remember that commercial, Omaha? Uh, Grow uh, apple trees and honeybees. Matter of fact, I hit, th- wait, there it is now. I, I hit, there it is. Omaha, you, you remember that commercial, bro? That, yes. That, that's, yes. That, that's, those, those are the camp, those are the kind of people I'm talking about when I call camp campfire Christians. They, I they, remember they, that, man. Yeah, yeah. That Coca Cola commercial is representative of, of precisely the kind of wishy washy, milk toast, insipid, and anemic unity that campfire Christians would have the church embrace, and exemplify, and propagate. Right. That's exactly what I'm talking. We just get together. Let's all get together on this hill over here, and let's just lock arms and sing together. Right. But but right. see, to, to to place my assertion about campfire Christians into even greater context, I want to again quote D. Martin Lloyd Jones from his book, The Basis of Christian Unity, which I encourage our listeners to get a copy of and read it. The Basis of Christian Unity by D. Martin Lloyd Jones. In that book, Lloyd Jones said this quote: "The fact is, of course." that in our misunderstanding of the New Testament and its teaching, we are all exalting a kind of niceness and politeness which are not to be found there. Lloyd Jones has said that kind of niceness and politeness is not even found in the New Testament. He says it's not even found in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Okay, continuing to quote Lloyd Jones here. Lloyd Jones says, why is such speech abominated today and regarded as sub-Christian? Because the notion of truth as something which can be objectively defined has gone. And we repl- we are replacing it by a flabby, sentimental notion of unity and fellowship, Lloyd-Jones says. He says we must speak the truth about such people in order that the children of the faith may be protected from their nefarious influence, mm. unquote. That was D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said mm. you don't find all this niceness and politeness around unity. You don't find that in the New Testament. You don't find mm-hmm. campfire Christians in the New Testament uh, uh, getting all together saying, I like to teach the world to sing. Now, you don't find that. He said you don't even find that in Jesus Christ himself. Right. So again, Lord Jones hits the nail on the head again. Any thoughts, mm-hmm. Omaha? A lot of thoughts, man. We're, we're, for, my first thought initially, especially when you, when you were quoting from J.C. Ryle, is just how plainly and directly those men speak. And, yes. um, you know, I mean, it's just just crystal clear. There's no ambiguity. There's no, well, I, I wonder what he really meant to say, you know. Uh, there's none of that with men like right. Ralph or or or, or, men, or men like Lloyd-Jones. I mean, it's just not. And and we, we need they, those kind of men. They, they get kicked off social media today uh, oh, off for being unloving. Absolutely. The, the, the tone police would run them off. Run them off. Absolutely. And, and and you and I both know of only a handful of men who are willing to to speak that plainly and clearly and effectively and uh, and, and, and the grief that they take as a as a result. And so modern day appeals to unity. I put I put unity in air quotes here find their origin in the idea of a leftist utopia. I mean, that's basically yes. what we were hearing. Yes. That's basically what yes. we were hearing in that song, right? Yes. I mean, this is yes. this is this is kind of the, the hippies' mantra. This is their gospel song. You know, that's their that's 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 their hymn. You know, they they like yes. to buy the world of coke, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in in this in this new world, feels I'll call it feels, not feelings. I call them feels and experiences melt away the hard edges of truth. Mm. The the yes. idea that we can unite around a coke and a smile while all the things that matter fade away is absolutely absurd. 
Indeed. The question, the question at that point then becomes, what happens after the soda bottle is empty and the reality of a sin-filled man, world come smacks on, you in the come face, on. right? Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> come on, man. I need some Hammond real quick on that right. one. Man. Come on, man. Come on, well, bro. What, 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 what happens after the soda bottle is empty and the reality of a sin-filled world actually smacks you in the face? Man, come on. <laughs> you know, Dude, I mean, that's I, wonderful. I, I love what you said about Campfire Christianity. We seem to be in a, in a Christian culture concerned more with offending others rather than speaking truth. And now I'm, I'm a bit slow. I'm a little bit slow on the uptake with Twitter, man. You, you've, you've helped me get my, my Twitter game up to par. So I appreciate, I appreciate you doing that. But however, I, I did catch a comment, man, that I thought fit well into our discussion. It was a, it was a tweet that I saw uh, by the Associate Professor of Christian Theology and the Director of, of the Center of Public Theology, Dr. Owen Strahan. And uh, oh, doc, Dr. Strand tweeted this. He was talking about this new religious liberty that we are able to now experience in our culture. I mean, he's mm-hmm. he, he was definitely, definitely tongue in cheek as he as he talked about it. He said it basically this quote in, in this new religious liberty, you are free to practice and say whatever you want, provided it is in precise conformity to cultural thought codes, does yes. not hurt anyone's feelings, is not exclusivist offers perpetual therapeutic affirmation, draws no distinctions, and leaves no trace, end quote. <laughs> Man. Man. I felt wow. I felt like yeah, I felt like Strand nailed it on the head with that one. This is he did. this is this is a yeah, this is a direct aim at you know aim ready aim fire at the at yeah. the campfire Christian, right? Yeah. Uh who, who desires that we all all just unite. It, it, it's kind of like uh and then I'll I'll talk about this this later, kind of Rodney King theology, right? Can't we all just just get Maybe. along? Yep. Yeah. I, I love what John MacArthur said in, in his book, The Truth War, uh, Fighting for Certainty in an Age of Deception. MacArthur writes this, quote, the truth exists outside of us and remains the same regardless of how we may perceive it. Truth, by definition, is as fixed and constant as God is immutable. That is the real truth, what Fr- Francis Schaeffer calls the true truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, 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 is the un- it is the unchanged truth and unchanging expression of who God is. It is not our own personal or arbitrary interpretation of reality. This kind of, this, this, and, and, and that's, the end of, that's the end of the quote from, from MacArthur. This kind of, of standard objective truth is the only way in which we can truly unite, right? We, we have to establish this, this banner of, of truth. I mean, we talked about yes. it earlier with when, when we when we when we were quoting from uh, from John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word uh, is truth. And, and that's the reality. The problem uh, is the campfire Christian. What they, they really desire is feelings over over facts. Right. Uh, they, they, they really desire an, an emotional experience rather than the reality of the real world. And so I, I'll, I'll stop my comments there. I've got more to say a little bit later, but but that's kind of my, my take on what you just ran through. That's good stuff, Hong Ha. You know, when it comes to the issue of unity and conversely, what I see as an inability on the part of the church, particularly in America, to discern between true biblical unity and the mirage that is the unity that is being proffered by the world, a fundamental problem that I've noticed is that there exists within the body of Christ a certain level of ignorance regarding what the gospel actually is and mm. what it is intended to accomplish. Now, I don't mm-hmm. say that cond- condescendingly. I'm talking about a dearth of, of knowledge, a dearth of biblical intelligence, if you will, a, a, a dearth of biblical literacy regarding mm-hmm. what the gospel actually is and what it is intended to accomplish. You know, in his classic book, Holiness, J.C. Ryle, whom I quoted a few moments ago, commented on that very thing when he said this, quote, Myriads of professing Christians nowadays seem utterly unable to distinguish things that differ. Like people afflicted with colorblindness, they are incapable of discerning what is true and what is false, what is sound and what is unsound. Carried away by a fancied liberality and charity, they seem to think everybody is right and nobody is wrong. Wow, Every that's clergyman, good. I know, right? This is awesome. He says, yeah. carried away by a fancy liberality. This is actually, this really touches on what uh, Dr. Orrin Strand uh, said earlier, with that, who, you, who you quoted mm-hmm. earlier, Omaha. Uh, mm-hmm. Ralph says, carried away by a fancied liberality and charity. 
They seem to think everybody is right and nobody is wrong. Everybody, I'm sorry, every clergyman is sound and none are unsound. Everybody mm-hmm. is going to be saved and nobody is going to be lost. Their religion is made up of negatives. And the only positive thing about them is that they dislike distinctness and think all extreme and decided and positive views are very naughty and very wrong. These people <laughs> live in a kind of mist or fog. Ral is killing this here. This these is this is live, on point. Th- these people live in a kind of mist or fog. They see nothing clearly and do not know what they believe. Hello, did you guys hear that? Ral said mm-hmm. they see nothing clearly and they don't know what they believe. They have not. I'm still quoting Ral here. They have not made up their minds about any great point in the gospel and seem content to be honorary members of all schools of thought. All schools of thought. They're, for their lives, Ralph says, for their lives, they could not tell you what they think is truth about justification or regeneration or sanctification or the Lord's Supper or baptism or faith or conversion or inspiration or the future state. They are eaten up with a morbid dread of controversy and an ignorant dislike of, quote, party spirit, unquote. And yet they really cannot define what they mean by those phrases. The only point you can make out is that they admire earnestness and cleverness and charity and cannot believe that any clever, earnest, charitable man can ever be in the wrong. And so they live on undecided. And too often undecided, they drift down to the grave without comfort in their religion and, I'm afraid, without hope, unquote. That, Woo! Was, that was some fire from J.C. Ryle that from his book, Holiness. Drop. Now, wow. you know, Omaha, as I consider those sobering words from J.C. Ryle, I fear that if you were to line up 10 professing Christians today and ask each of them to give a biblical definition of the gospel, eight out of 10, if not nine out of 10, will be completely unable to do so. That's because the vast majority of professing Christians don't know what the gospel actually is. In fact, I would dare to say that most professing believers perceive the gospel to be merely moralism. It's just a set of behavioral and ethical rules to follow as opposed to a person, capital P, namely Jesus Christ, in whom, according to Colossians 1.14, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, speaking of earlier, when you alluded to the fact that we were in Missouri, we've been to Florida, Missouri, Louisiana, I forget where else we've been, but you and I had an opportunity, Omar, to talk about something very interesting. You talked about in your form, your now former role, as discipleship pastor at Westside Baptist Church in Omaha, Nebraska, there was sort of a, 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 a pattern, a template, a model that you followed to teach everyone there what the gospel is. Would you mind sharing that with our listeners for a couple of minutes? Yeah, yeah, man. I, I, I really, I, I really agree completely wholeheartedly with you that if you lined up 10 people, eight out of 10, if not nine out of 10, would have a difficult time unpacking the gospel. Um, I, I would go to class after class and just ask people, Hey, tell me what the gospel and people would have different random things that they would say. And so in an effort to just kind of make sure that everyone had a, a basics, uh, I really spent time establishing, uh, from first Corinthians 15, three through eight, where, where Paul, Paul says that he's delivered that, which is of, of first importance, that Christ mm-hmm. died for our sins, accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. He appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. Uh, and then he appeared to more than 500. And then as one untimely born, uh, 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 Paul says that he, he also appeared to me, verses, uh, verses seven and eight. I used that and said, how could I boil this down? And so I just boiled down the gospel into the life, death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. Uh, and all of this is, yeah. ac- all this is according to scripture. So I, it, there's not a class that I've taught anywhere uh, for any lengthy period of time where I've shared with them how to, how to express the message of the gospel that won't say the gospel is the life, death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Now, the, mm-hmm. you, and, and again, whenever I'm teaching evangelism, I, I tell them, you're not going to walk up to somebody and say life, death, burial and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. 
what you're going to do is you're going to have those as 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 coat hangers, as benchmarks, right. as bullet right. points for a deeper, greater depth of the storyline. But you know that if you're explaining the message of the gospel, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sins are, are, are the key benchmarks, are the key bullet points that you're going to begin talking about. You're going to talk about the holiness of God and how our sins separated us from God. But you're going to talk mm-hmm. about how Christ came and lived a perfect life, died a death he didn't deserve, was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. And that if we repent of our sins and and uh, we repent of our sins and and, and uh, present faith uh, in in that in the finished work of Christ, uh, that, that we would experience eternal life. So again, the, mm-hmm. the, I, I say it over and over and over again in the class. By the time I teach a 30, 40 minute class, they've heard life, death, burial, and resurrection mm-hmm. of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin about 50 times. Mm-hmm. So, so they get, oh, he's anchoring, he's anchoring this truth in those words so that we can get it. Right. That's kind of how I do it. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, man. You know, to expand on what you just shared with our listeners, Omaha, I want to invite our listeners to consider how the French reformer, the great French reformer, John Calvin, explains the gospel in his classic work, uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion. Calvin said this, quote, God's son was given to us, setting aside his will, not only devoting his life to his father's good pleasure, but did not shrink from enduring the horror of death when he bade him do so. So as to appease his majesty, that is to appease God's majesty, which was angered by our rebellion. So it happened that the heavenly father, through the merit of Christ's obedience, was reconciled to humankind, which before he had utterly abhorred. For Christ, by his death, offered his father a fragrant sacrifice to satisfy his righteous judgment and to acquire eternal sanctification for believers. He shed his sacred blood as the price of our redemption in order to extinguish God's wrath, which was kindled against us, and to purge our iniquity. Scripture stresses nothing more consistently than this, that Christ, by virtue of his sacrifice, has earned the goodwill of the Father, which is our foremost pledge and assurance of life, that the filth and stain of sin, which turn God's will against us, have been washed and cleansed by his blood, unquote. That was John Calvin from his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Now, my point, Omaha, in asking you to share that definition of the gospel with our listeners, and conversely, my quote in that passage from Calvin's Institutes is to argue that Christians cannot talk about unity without first talking about what the gospel says about it, okay? Now, when you advocate for unity, what specifically do you mean by that? Come on, come okay. on, man. What specifically do you mean by that? You see, for the Christian, unity is not some nebulous, ambiguous, or arbitrary concept that we are to latch ourselves onto at the mere suggestion of it by someone, regardless of whether or not that person claims to be a believer in Jesus Christ. No, biblical unity is objectively definable. Come on, man. Biblical unity is objectively definable so that we can know with certainty what it looks like and what it does not look like, what it entails and what it does not entail, and with whom we should unite and with whom we should not unite. As Charles Haddon Spurgeon said in his sermon titled The Peacemaker, which he preached back on December 8, 1861, Spurgeon said this quote, now, this is gonna this is gonna make some people pass out. So you if you're driving right, you, you might want to pull over and, and listen to this. Spurgeon said this quote, we are to be first pure, then peaceable. Our peaceableness is never to be a compact with sin or an alliance with that which is evil. Unquote. Come on, wait, 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 hold up, man. You you're gonna have to start again. I'm gonna need some hamming on this right here. I'm gonna need I some mean, hamming. I- B3 on this right here. Yeah, yeah, let me go just go back and reiterate again. Biblical unity. This is this is what I want our listeners to get. Biblical unity is objectively definable. Okay. So that we can know with certainty. We can know with certainty what it looks like and what it does not look like. What it entails and what it does not entail. And with whom we should unite and with whom we should not unite. Which is why Spurgeon says this. Quote, we are to be first pure, then peaceable. See, see, Omaha, we got it backwards. 
come on, See, man. We, 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 we got we got this thing all the way back. Come, what, what, listen, what, what, listen, what, listen, 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 listen. Take come on, man. your time. Because take my what, time, sir? Pastor. Please, please take, take your time. Take my time, Pastor. Come on, because what you what, what you're about to explain right here is the crux, the of, crux the of the issue. This it's this the is the it issue. right here. Yes, yes. See, we have this thing. Spurgeon has it right. Spurgeon has the order correct. Okay. It, to put a little Latin spin on this, this is the, the orders unitas. This is the orders unit. Spurgeon has the order of unity correct. He says we are to be first pure, then peaceable. But the church today, we're so soft, we flipped that. We've totally inverted this. We think we need to be peaceable first. And that that is a reflection of purity. No, Spurgeon has the order correct. He says we are to be first pure, then peaceable. Our peaceableness is never to be a compact with sin or an alliance with that which is evil, unquote. Okay, that's from his sermon titled The Peacemaker, again, December 8th, 1861. Now, we would all do well to consider those words from Spurgeon in light of the strong admonition from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Paul says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? That's 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Now, as it relates to the topic of unity, what Paul is saying to us in that text is that a unity that is, as again, going back to those prepositional phrases that I emphasized earlier, earlier a unity that is of the faith, and of the spirit involves spiritual discernment. Did you hear me on that? A unity that is of the faith and of the spirit involves spiritual discernment. It involves having the spiritual discipline and wisdom to stop and consider what exactly am I being invited to unite myself with or to partner with or to fellowship with, okay? As followers of Jesus Christ, we should be discerning and circumspect enough and courageous enough, I might add, to stop and ask discerning questions before committing ourselves to something or to someone that or who in reality is not in unanimity or agreement with what the Word of God teaches. Now you see, Omaha, a common mistake many professing Christians make is that they view the church as if it were this big tent where mm -hmm. under the pretense of loving your neighbor, every mm -hmm. person of every conceivable theological ideological or philosophical persuasion is to be welcomed and made to feel accepted and comfortable and loved. That's what right. that's, again, we've got this thing backwards. That that's is not that's that, that's, that campfire, that's that campfire Christianity. That's that, that's, that, that's that campfire Christianity right there. That is not what Jesus taught. This is what D. L D. Martin Lowe Jones said earlier. He said, you don't find a kind of that, that kind of niceness, that kind of politeness in the scriptures. Consider what Jesus himself said. Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. In Matthew 10, verses 34 through 39, he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against. I, I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Okay? Now, my point here is that the gospel draws lines. The gospel draws lines. It draws those lines not in the sand, but in concrete. Okay? The gospel draws lines in, the, in concrete, which is to say that the lines the gospel draws are inflexible, immutable, and uncompromising. Inflexible, immutable, and uncompromising. It is in light of that reality that I have to ask these questions of evangelicals and non-evangelicals alike, such as the individuals that I cited earlier at the top of this episode in my opening monologue. Listen, these are some questions I have for you. How is it that any so-called evangelical leader or evangelical organization can exhort followers of Jesus Christ to unite themselves with politicians, such as in this case, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, who in their own words have said that as president and vice president, respectively, they would continue to support the murder of unborn image bearers of God through abortion? That's one question. My second question is this, how is it that any so-called evangelical leader or evangelical organization can exhort followers of Jesus Christ to unite themselves with a presidential administration whose platform is committed 
to affirming and advancing the LGBTQ agenda under the banner of civil rights mm -hmm. when God's word is abundantly clear regarding homosexuality? Mm -hmm. Third question, how is it that any so-called evangelical leader or evangelical organization can exhort followers of Jesus Christ to unite themselves with a presidential administration that believes two biological men or two biological women can, quote, marry, unquote, one another. Mm -hmm. Now, you're asking me to unite with that? No, nah, bro, not going to happen. Not me, not now, not ever. Thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Man, I, I, there was a lot that was there, and uh, we, we discussed this situation to a degree in a previous episode on the, on the doctrine of elections. Uh, it, it was during that time that we looked at the listener very clearly, very specifically, not to abandon their doctrine at the door yes, when they entered true. the voting booth. Remember that? Yep. We warned them. We warned them. You, you, you raised three areas of, of where modern-day evangelicals are advocating what I'll call false unity false unity mm -hmm. they're asking us to, to unify under the banner of the murder of the unborn under the banner of advancing the lgbtq agenda and and really intersectionality uh where whether it's same-sex marriage or the role of women <clears throat> or the isolation of of human beings creating in the image of god with with identity politics blacks over here latinos over here you know this group that group and and the like these these issues were for some uh, in, at least in the past, where where the Bible had once provided a unified standard upon which we could all agree. You know, mm -hmm. previously speaking, that that we all we all would open our Bible, we would read what was there, and we'd say, okay, we we all agree with this. But now, under the guise of of a need for nuance, and you and I both right. have covered the ground of of, of yes. nuance, right? Yes. Uh, these modern day evangelicals have abandoned long held positions on these issues. Now, here's at the end of the day, man, here's what I'm trying to figure out. What what do these even specifically evangelicals believe themselves to be gaining by holding these positions? Now, before we answer that, I, I know you're going to raise the question and address it later. So my goal is not to even go to any depth with it here. I will say that, that I recognize that advocacy for social justice requires the codifying of victimhood into the intersections of law. Yes. And now you, you see you see what I did there the yes. intersections yep. of law yep. let me, <laughs> yep. let me yep. let me say that again I, I recognize that the advocacy for social justice requires the codifying of victimhood into the intersections of law however what in the name of Christianity causes anyone to unite themselves with candidates whose policy positions are in complete opposition to a biblical worldview? Yep. Dur during this during this election cycle, there, there were a group of of, quote, pro-life evangelicals for Biden, end quote. Yes. You remember this? Yes. Yeah. I, 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 want, I went I went to their website because I thought, you know what? I, I want to read from their own words what they believe and what they're after and, and see and listen to hear if and whether and or not their their positions were congruent. With scripture, but but I, I just wanted the other thing I wanted to see. I knew I knew the positions weren't. I wanted to see how they justified their incongruent position. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I so I went to their website, pro life evangelicals for Biden. So here's here's what I found. They said this quote: As pro life evangelicals, we disagree with Vice President Biden and the Democratic platform on the issue of abortion, but we believe a biblically shaped commitment to the sanctity of human life compels us to a consistent ethic of life that affirms the sanctity of human life from beginning to end. I'm continuing to quote from them. Many things that good political decisions, many things that good political decisions could change, destroy persons created in the image of God and violate the sanctity of human life. Again, continuing the quote for them. Poverty kills millions every year. So does a lack of health care and smoking. Racism kills. Unless we quickly make major changes, devastating climate change will kill tens of millions. Poverty, lack of accessible health care services, smoking, racism, and climate change are all pro-life issues, end quote. Now, I, I can see you before before you roll back into your chair with, you know, just ro rolling the eyes into the back of your head. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, you know what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if our listeners picked up on what you just did. Because what you just did, what you just did was worked out what you said earlier before you quoted from that website. You, 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 you basically gave them an example from pro-lifers for Biden of the social justice being intersectioned into law. That's exactly what you just did. And I just wonder if our listeners caught that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was brilliant, by the way, bro. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. So, so, so now there's, there's this new, what they're creating, what they've established is this nuanced, and again, I say nuanced in air quotes, this nuanced position that, that, that says this, everything kills, so it's all right to vote for a pro-choice candidate. Yep. Now, m- most are blind to how untenable this new position really is, right? The, the, the position of these pro-life evangelicals for Bi- Biden could have, could have been actually more easily articulated in this way. People die, so why not vote for Biden, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, or, or they could have said this, Death comes to everyone. Why not? Why not the people in the womb? Yep. Right. Death comes to everyone. Why? Why, why not to the person in the womb? Regardless yep. of how this this nuanced position, uh, which will serve. Uh, let me say. Let me let me restate that. Regardless, this this there's now this nuanced position, which will serve as a new form of postmodern evangelicalism, which says if government is unable to provide complete safety for me, right. my whole life then it's fine for me to vote for the pro-abortion candidate. Right. If, if, if I'm not safe, no one should be safe. Basically, that's what right. they're saying. Yep. You know, if there were, if, in, in their words, if, if, if they can't be safe, then the child in the womb sure as heck doesn't deserve any additional protection. Yep. I was, I, I was in a Twitter exchange with someone who tried to make the case that the murder of babies in the womb was equivalent to the story of children being separated from their parents at the border. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, it, it, in this person's mind, voting for a politician whose policies advocate the murder of children was actually better than voting for a politician whose policies temporarily separated a child from their parent. Now, if you can't if you can't see the difference between a child who's still alive being separated from a and and someone committing the crime of murder of a child in a womb, I, I don't know that there's much left to say. The logic and reason has definitely left the room. Now, last, lastly, I'll say this. I believe it was James White who coined the term for this new religion called safism. Have you seen this? The safe, seen safism? That. Yeah, like safism. I like it. Yeah. It, it, it actually impacts everything. It's the, re, it's the religion of, of safism that informs this new position by evangelicals. Safism is the idea that, that government has the responsibility to ensure safety for all or safety for none. Mm. Mm-hmm. Any any violation of safism and, and these new religious adherents, they, they, they can then justify voting for pro-abortion candidates. Mm-hmm. The, the justification, as I said earlier, is if they aren't safe, then no one should be safe, especially the child in the womb. In the name of safism, adherents will ignore government overreach currently dictating no, a number of people and how, how the number of people that they can have in their homes. So in the name of safism, government is overreaching and that's okay. Government is actually telling you how many people you can have in your home during Christmas time under the guise of safety. And now yeah. under this new religion of safism, that's okay. Now, again, I know that's related to COVID and, 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 and I digress, but, but all of this is this whole worldview is all encompassing. My point is this brother, and I'll, I'll stop here. Far too many so-called evangelicals have abandoned right thinking, and they now want you and I to unite with them on this path that leads to destruction. And just like you, Daryl, I absolutely refuse to do so. Amen, brother. Amen. You know, thanks for sharing that verse. That that's I, I could go down that COVID. You know, we 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 could actually do a second know, episode. Yeah, just from the the COVID aspects of this. Yeah, but but yeah. I, I won't go there. You know, I, I just want to continue on your train of thought there. You know, in his sermon titled "Hezekiah and the Ambassadors of Vainglory Rebuked," Hezekiah and the Ambassadors or Vainglory Rebuked, preached on August fifth, eighteen sixty six, the Prince of Preachers, as he was affectionately known, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this quote: "When a Christian man." constantly acts like a worldly man, can it be possible that he is acting rightly? When the two actions are precisely the same and you discern no difference, is there not grave cause to to suspect that there is no difference? 
For by mm. the fruit, you must know the tree. And if two trees bear precisely the same fruit, is there not cause to suspect that they are the same sort of trees? Unquote. That was Charles Spurgeon from his sermon, Hezekiah and the Ambassadors, or Vainglory Rebuked. Now, along that same train of thought in the book, A Theology for the Church, in the chapter titled The Church, Mark Dever, who is pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., said this, quote, The church experiences unity only as believers are united in God's truth as it is revealed in Scripture. As wow. it is revealed in Scripture, unquote. Now, those words from Spurgeon and Dever bring to my mind one of the most direct admonitions and forewarnings in all of Scripture. It is found in James chapter 4, verse 4, where the Apostle James declares this. He says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Mm -hmm. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's James 4.4. 4. Now, James says that whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That prepositional phrase, of the world, takes us back to Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, where twice in verse 14 and again in verse 16, Jesus says of believers that they are not of the world. Jesus uses that phrase twice. In John 17, 14, he says, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Then in John 17, 16, Jesus says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, to walk in a manner, to walk in a manner that is evidently and manifestly in contradistinction from the world is the hallmark of those who truly belong to Jesus Christ. Now, with that reality in mind, the question for us, the question for all of us who profess to be Christians becomes this. How can we, who are not of the world, think it admirable or commendable, let alone biblical, to unite ourselves with the world in any way, shape, or form, whether it be politically, philosophically, ideologically, or otherwise? Come on, man. Come on. Jesus said in John 17, 14, that the world, speaking of, uh, speaking of his, his, his people, his children, his body, Jesus says that the world has hated them. Mm -hmm. Now, contrary to what many evangelical leaders today are encouraging the church to do, the Word of God teaches the exact opposite. Believers in Christ are to deliberately live in contradistinction to the world, the result of which that is, is that we will be hated which literally means that we will be detested and rejected by the world, not, not embraced and accepted by it. L listen, unity that is apart from that which agrees with and is in accordance with the Spirit of God and the teachings of Scripture is nothing more than moralism. I refer to that kind of humanistic, man-centered, man-exalting thinking as unitarianism. And to those who would subscribe to or endorse that kind of humanistic false peace, yeah, as yeah. Unitarians, okay, <laughs> not Unitarians, Unitarian. Unity. Yeah, I got you. Unit Unitarianism, not Unitarianism, Unitarianism, and Unitarians. Unitarianism reduces the biblical doctrine of unity to mere moralism under the pretense of a type of unity that is man-centered and man-concocted. Unitarianism operates under the impetus that the church should aspire to be loved and accepted by the world, an objective that is completely antithetical to what the biblical gospel teaches, and which is unambiguous in its declaration that as followers of Jesus Christ, to live in the world as we're to live in the world as the otherworldly creations that we are. And as we do that, that the world will hate us, not love us. Unitarianism is the kind of Christianity that advocates, advocates a quote-unquote gospel of just getting along. You referred to it earlier, uh, Omaha's Rodney King believism, Rodney King theology, just getting right. along with everyone. Right. But Unitarianism is a false gospel that's willing to sacrifice truth for the sake of peace, heresy for the sake of harmony, 
and false teaching for the sake of fellowship. So that ultimately, now listen to this, ultimately under Unitarianism, the complete absence of confrontation, disagreement, discord, and conflict becomes the asset test of what true Christian unity is and looks like. Okay, that's Unitarianism. You must understand this. Unitarianism believes, and Unitarian, Unitarianism would argue that the complete absence of confrontation, disagreement, discord, and conflict becomes the acid test of what true Christian unity is and looks like. But unity with the world, and even with other professing believers who call for that kind of unity, is not the acid test of the gospel. The acid test of the gospel is faith in Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, because without that, there is no gospel to begin with. Come okay? on, man. Now, though there can be a type of unity that we can have apart from Christ, what J.C. Rao called a false peace, there can be no true gospel-centered unity apart from faithfulness to Christ and to his word. When you remove Christ from the gospel, what do you have? You have moralism. That's what you have. And as Pastor John MacArthur said in his book, Christ Called to Reform the Church, quote, morality on its own is no solution. It damns just like immorality. Morality cannot turn the stony heart to flesh. It cannot break the chains of sin, and it cannot reconcile us to God. In that sense, morality alone is as empty to save as any satanic religion. Unquote. <laughs> wow, wow. That was John wow. MacArthur from his book, Christ Called to Reform the Church. The unity that is of the Spirit of God and of the faith that is taught in the gospel is not some kind of universal, ecumenical kind of campfire Christianity where we just come alongside one another singing kumbaya without regard to the truth. You see, no true biblically, no true biblically, b- 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 biblically, unity is a unity, okay? Mm-hmm. Biblical unity is a unity that is inherently divisive. Wow. Okay? Biblical unity is a unity that is inherently divisive. I quoted, uh, I read Jesus' own words earlier. Jesus said, don't don't think that I came to bring bring peace. Mm -hmm. I came to bring a sword. I came to set people against one another. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, So, no, true biblical unity is a unity that is inherently divisive. It draws a hard line. It is a unity that is the result of addition by subtraction, meaning biblical unity is motivated first and foremost by love and conviction of the truth of God's word. And it is that same motivation and conviction that rejects anything that does not align itself with that biblical standard of truth. Okay? Listen to these words, from again, from the book Holiness by J.C. Rao. J.C. Rao with more fire here. Quote, true Christianity will cost a man the favor of the world. He must be content to be thought ill of by man if he pleases God. He must count it no strange thing to be mocked, ridiculed, slandered, persecuted, and even hated. He must not be surprised to find his opinions and practices in religion despised and held up to scorn. He must submit to be thought by many a fool, an enthusiast, and a fanatic to have his words perverted and his actions misrepresented. In fact, he must not marvel at all if some call him mad. I dare say this also sounds, this all sounds hard. We naturally dislike, we naturally dislike unjust dealings and false charges and think it very hard to be accused without cause. We should not be flesh and blood if we did not wish to have the good opinion of our neighbors. It is always unpleasant to be spoken against and forsaken and lied about and to stand alone. But there is no help for it. The cup which our master drank must be drunk by his disciples. They must be, quote, despised and rejected of men, unquote, quoting Isaiah 53, 3. Let us set down that item last in our account. To be a Christian, it will cost a man the favor of the world, unquote. Mm. Wow. That was J.C. Rao from his classic work, Holiness. To be a Christian, Rao says, it will cost a man the favor of the world. Thoughts, Omaha? What you said regarding the uh, Unitarianism, it reminds me, and we talked about it earlier, we referenced it twice, of what I called Rodney King theology or or king's koinonia right as, as i said I, I just realized that that the that the rodney king incident for some 
may not be a reference that they easily understand, right? The, the yeah. riots, the riots associated with the King incident actually began April 29th, 1992. That was 26 years ago. So oh. Rodney King, Rodney King serves as a historical equivalent, you know, crude as it may be. Of, of our George Floyd incident today. Of course, King didn't lose his life during the incident. Now, the, the King situation took place as a particular narrative was crafted on the basis of seemingly, of seemingly damaging video evidence. And after a jury trial acquitted four officers of the Los Angeles Police Department for excessive use of force in the arrest and the arrest and beating of Rodney King, six days of rioting would break out in Los Angeles. Uh, mm. After 63 people had been killed and more than a, than 12,000 arrests and an estimated $1 billion of damage had impacted uh, business and communities, Rodney King would hold a press conference where his now famous speech, his, his famous Can't We All Just Get Along speech right. took place. I, I wanted to quote what he actually said because I, I think it's incredibly relevant to what we're hearing today. Uh, what he said was, quote, people, he said, he said people, I just want to say, you know, can we all just get along? Can we get along? Can we stop making it, making it horrible for older people and the kids? It's just not right. It's just not right. It's not, it's not going to change anything. We'll get our justice, please. Can we all get along here? Uh, we all can get along. I mean, we're all stuck here for a while. Let's just try to work it out. Now you see what that's that's the end of the quote. You see what Rodney King was trying to do was call for peace and calm after after a rather you know violent situation. There were six days of rioting that took place, and initially I'd begun to think about how this related to evangelicals today. But the more and more I think of it, that is not what modern day evangelicals are doing. They are not calling for peace in the midst of violence. Many were not calling for peace when the violence erupted in our streets this summer. Many thought it made them look hip and cool and relevant mm, to go man, in. Man, come on. I stand I, with protesters, right? But, yes. but, but I, I digress. What, what these modern day evangelicals are actually doing is advocating violence. And I'm not talking about in a figurative, figurative violence either. What they're advocating, they're advocating positions which do literal violence to children mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, they're wow. asking us, they're asking us to unify with this pro-life evangelicals. And I just can't seem to get this off my mind, Daryl. So-called pro-life evangelicals for Biden are asking that we advocate the policy decisions of a man who said that he would repeal the Hyde Amendment. Now, now for those who don't know what the Hyde Amendment, that was the, the Hyde Amendment uh, has blocked federal Medicaid funding for abortion services since 1976. And since 1994, there have been three extremely narrow exceptions when continuing pregnancy will endanger the life of the patient or when pregnancy results from a rape or incest. And what this means is that Medicaid dollars, your tax dollars, cannot and will not be used to cover abortions. That's what the Hyde Amendment was in place uh, to protect. That was Joe Biden who said that he would repeal the Hyde Amendment, allowing millions of more women access to abortions at taxpayer expense. And what that means in, in short language is that you and I would be paying for those abortions. Far from simple moralism, modern day evangelicals are currently asking that we all unite with immoralism. Wow. This, this, is, this isn't an appeal to moralism. This is an appeal to immoralism. Wow, like the, great I, point. The, the idea of, of getting along at all costs is far too expensive a proposition in light of the immoralism that's attached to the idea. Now, just, just quickly as I wrap, man, allow me to say a quick word for those who would point to the immorality of a president who has affairs or appeals to sexually inappropriate conversations. There's a big difference. Now, there's a big difference between conversations that none of us should engage in and policy decisions that impact every American. Far, far too many have have no private public distinctions when it comes to making policy, which, which we all must endure. Now, now I, I may have blown this whole section of commentary rather than amplifying the point that, that you made with regard to following the cross of Christ or the cost rather of following the cross of Christ. I, I know the final point that you're making is that, that our positions should align with God rather than to seek the public support 
of popular thinking. I just had to kind of make that make that point. We, this is not an appeal to moralism. This is an appeal to unify with that which is absolutely immoral. That's the point that I wanted to make. That's an excellent, brilliant point, Omaha man. Excellent. You know, no, not not don't don't apologize for, for for going that route, bro. That was much needed uh, input that you gave there. You know, and I just want to say as an aside. You know, in our uh, in episode 105, the doctrine of elections, one of the points that we uh, reiterated over and over again, that politicians are sinners. Politicians mm. are sinners. Be they're, they're sinners before they're elected to office. They're sinners in office. They're going to be sinners after they leave office. Mm-hmm. So, uh, people people who want to make a comparison between, uh, you know, a a uh, a president who engages in locker room uh, talk per se. Uh, mm-hmm. Up against a a a, a supposed president uh, elect who uh, openly advocates the murder of unborn children. My my question to them is this: What what do you expect an unbeliever to behave like? They they they, they act as if wearing the title president is somehow salvific in and of itself. That, that, <laughs> right. that being being elected is is regenerative of a person's heart. Mm-hmm. No, no, absolutely not. Um, I don't know President Trump's heart. I don't know Joe Biden's heart. You know, but what, from what I can see from both of them, from just trying to observe objectively from the fruit that they both bear, neither one of them are believers. So how should you expect an unbeliever to behave? Right. You shouldn't expect an unbeliever to behave like a believer. And yet here we are calling out uh, the, the sins of these men, or at least one of them in, in the example that you gave uh, uh, in the uh, in the input that you just gave a couple of minutes ago, they're calling mm-hmm. out uh, pr- uh, President Trump's behavior. Well, okay. Well, how would you expect an unbeliever to behave? Mm-hmm. Okay. L- listen, I'm just trying to make, make this simple. I, but but there, there's a difference. It's a point I made earlier. People are, and, and when I say people, I mean evangelicals, professing evangelicals, they're gauging Trump up against a standard of moralism not right. biblical regeneration. Right. Okay. Right, 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 right. And, and at the same time, and at the same time, brother, while they're holding up this standard of moralism in one instance, they're asking us to unify with that, which is absolutely immoral. Immoral. Ab- absolutely immoral. objectively evil with regard to the, the, the murder of a child in a womb. So you got locker room talk on one end, which yeah. is, which, which, which is, which is, I, I don't even want to pretend to to say that that's good, right, or just, but that's not, that's not law, that's right. that's not that's that is that is not something that we're now that's required not, that's not to, to participate in, right? That's not policy. <clears throat> we're not required to participate in that, engage in that, uh, advocate that, teach that to our children in any way, shape, or form. However, everyone's tax dollars, if the Hyde Amendment is removed, will be required by law to participate. In the in the in the murder of a child in the womb. So 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 evangelicals who are trying to argue from that standpoint, from that perspective, from that position, you know, with all due respect, you are you're walking hypocrites. You're walking contradictions. You're trying to hold one man up to a moral standard while not applying the same standard to another guy. Mm-hmm. Or to flip it, why don't you apply the same standard of or or of or, or, or passivity? about Joe Biden's immoral, immoral uh, policy positions. Mm-hmm. Why don't you apply that to President Trump's personal positions? Either either hold them both to the same moral standard or hold them both to the same immoral standard. <laughs> right, right. That's a great point. You have to do one or the other. Otherwise, That's you're a, a hypocrite. Point. That's a great point. I think I think it goes back to something you, you mentioned earlier, which is the, uh, j- just just a dearth of biblical literacy so that people have people don't have categories. Right. They're 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 they're, they're devoid of any kind of sp- specific spiritual uh, categories, political categories, even. I mean, you could you could you could even look at it from from that framework, e- even from a basic secular standpoint. And, and with, with the common grace that God provides us all mm-hmm. not having having categories by which to place these things in. Okay, murder is in a category here. Okay, separation of children from their parents, that's in a category 
here, um, locker room talk that's in a category here, all of it equally sinful, but some having greater implications than others on the basis of, of the category that they're placed in and an understanding of, of, the, of the magnitude of their impact within culture. Exactly. It's a great point, man. You know, it's, it's like the opposite of intersectionality. I would, I, I would, I would call it desectionality. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I would, I would call it desectionality. <laughs> So, right. but, but to get back on point, I just, uh, just to continue the, th- the train of thought that we left off on, I'm glad we got off on that little bit of a, a tangent. I think that was value added there, uh, Omaha. So, so thanks for, for taking us down that road. I just want to say in, in the book, uh, Culture, okay, in the book Culture, Living as Citizens of Heaven on Earth, the late pastor and author A.W. Tozer said this, quote, he said, the historic church, while she was a hated minority group, had a moral power that made her terrible to evil and invincible before her foes. When the Roman masses, without without change of heart, were made Christians by baptism, Christianity gained popularity and lost her spiritual glow. Don't miss that, folks. Tosa says when the Roman masses, without change of heart, were made Christians without change of heart, he says, were made Christians by baptism, Christianity gained popularity but lost her spiritual glow. From there, she went on to adopt the ways of Rome and to follow her pagan religions. The fish caught the fishermen, and what started out to be the conversion of Rome became finally the conversion of the church. From that ignominious captivity, the church has never been fully delivered, Tozer says. Christianity's scramble for popularity today is an unconscious acknowledgement of spiritual decline, Tozer says. Her eager fawning at the feet of the world's great is a grief to the Holy Spirit and an embarrassment to the sons of God. The lick-spittle attitude of popular Christian leaders toward the world's celebrities would make such men as Elijah sick to the stomach. Then uh, Tozer closes with this. We are sent to bless the world, but never are we told to compromise with it. Our glory lies in a spiritual withdrawal from all that builds on dust. Unquote. I love those last two sentences. Tozer Tozer says, we are sent to bless the world, but never are we told to compromise with it. Our glory lies in a spiritual withdrawal from all that builds on dust. Wow. Mm, You know, Omaha, yeah, it is very powerful. And as I reflect on those powerful words from Tozer, some questions I have of evangelical leaders such as those whom I cited at the top of this episode are these, okay? What is it that you expect to gain by urging your fellow brothers and sisters to pursue harmony, solidarity, and consensus with men and women whose lives and whose worldviews are so egregiously unbiblical? What, What is the payoff for you? What golden calf is of such value and importance to you that you are willing to set aside the principles and precepts of God's word in exchange for it. Mm -hmm. Is it the pride of experiencing increased celebrity and name recognition? Is it because you covet a blue check mark on your social media accounts? Perhaps you already have a blue check mark and think that 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 somehow, that that insignia somehow makes the things you say equal to, if not more, authoritative than the things God has said. Wow. Are you doing this because you've been promised or desire a position of political power? Whatever the reason and whatever the reward, the reality is, whether you realize it or not, is that you're only building on dust. You're only building on dust, as A.W. Tozer said. It's 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, is it in Omaha? Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life 
is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And in keeping with that train of thought, consider what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But may it never be, but may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That was Paul in, in uh, Galatians 6, 14. To be crucified to the world is to confess that you are dead to the world, that the world with all its ungodly systems, all its unbiblical philosophies, all its vain promises of happiness mean absolutely nothing to you when compared to the glorious, eternal, and unfading riches that are yours in Jesus Christ and are awaiting you, are awaiting you in heaven with your name on it. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That means that your treasures in heaven have your name on it. And you want to exchange the world for that? You know, the great hymn writer of the 18th century, Isaac Watts, put it this way. In his beloved hymn, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross, which was originally written, uh, originally published, rather, 313 years ago in the year 1707. I didn't realize that that hymn was this old. But Isaac Watts wrote these words. He says, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me most. I sacrifice him, I sacrifice them to his blood. What Isaac Watts is expressing in those lyrics is essentially what the Apostle Paul expressed in Galatians 6.14, which I cited just a few moments ago. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Watts said all the vain things that charm me most I sacrificed them to his blood. And sadly, one of the vain things that charms us as believers today, Omaha, is the acceptance and approval of the world. Of course, that's nothing new. That's always been the case. Right. But as Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, quote, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And he who has the smile of the ungodly must look for the frown of God. Wow. Unquote. Any thoughts, my man, on that? Man, a lot of, a lot of ground that, that you covered. Again, loving the, the quotes from um, A.W. Tozer, just powerful what, what he stated there. Um, the hymn that you point us back to, which really unpacks for us the magnitude and beauty of, of Christ and his cross. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that those who... Uh, oppose the position that we hold are going to, are, are going to say, you know, they, there they go again. You know, it's the gospel. It's, it's Christ. It's, you know, it, they, they're always wanting, they're always wanting to add to that. Yeah. You know, as, as, as you and I go back to the cross, as you and I go back to Christ and crucified, as you and I go back to the gospel, as you and I go back to the word of God, they're, they're constantly thinking that there's something in addition to those things that are necessary uh, for us to really experience the unity uh, of, right. of the faith, there, there, right. there's, some, there's something in addition to that. Anyway, I, I also knew that you were gonna you were gonna raise the question: What is there to gain, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For the for the world for the world, it's obvious they get to gain the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, now believers who hold the idea that compromise with the world is somehow e e e either is somehow beneficial, they either have a deformed faith. They either have a deformed faith, which is in need of discipleship, mm -hmm. or a destroyed faith, right. where true apostasy has already occurred. Mm -hmm. Now, seriously, we are constantly asking ourselves this question. When you and I get together, we're reading the kinds of things we're reading in the Twitter sphere. When we're when we're listening to certain speakers say the kinds of things calling for, you know, either whether it's social justice calling for utilizing uh, analytical tools like CRT, yeah. um, right. when, they're, when they're appealing to inter intersectionality and victimhood, um, when there are calls for, for unity with, with things that we 
we recognize our evil, as we've mentioned in this in this podcast previously. We're, we, you and I are constantly asking ourselves this question. At what point are we ready to treat these people like unbelievers in need of the gospel? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we, we're yeah. constantly asking ourselves that question. At the at the end of the day, Jesus should be enough. And the song that you quoted expressed that beautifully. I, I'm, I'm, I'm of the mindset to ask, why would an evangelical social justice or someone leaning in that direction even bother to celebrate Christ's incarnation this season? Man, come on, bro. Why, why, on, why would you why would you even bother right See, seeing that the incarnation and the sacrifice of Christ was was in it was insufficient at least until other analytical tools could be made available like CRT and intersectionality what is there to celebrate really right man come on I I, 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 I realize I'm, I'm being I'm being facetious however someone has got to explain to me if we're going to unite with this kind <laughs> of thinking, Am, am I really that far off? I mean, am, am I really that far off? In, in not at all, bro. That, not at all. Yeah, that, that these people may not really be saved. I know. Listen, I know we're not supposed to raise those kinds of questions. I, I, I know we're not supposed to ask what the motivation of someone's heart is, or at least not assume that we can read what that is. I get that. But at the end of the day, at what point do we become fruit inspectors to the degree that we go, hmm. Yep. Yep. Some, something's a foul there. Yep. Something something's a foul yep. there. And I mean that, that's 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 my thought about that about that that section there. Man, I appreciate that uh sermonette you just gave, bro. That was deep. that was <laughs> awesome, bro. I appreciate that. You know, our good friend Dr. Scott Anyall, who serves as associate professor and director of doctoral worship studies at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, he said the following in a tweet dated November 20th, 2020. Dr. Scott Anyall said this quote. The Apostle Paul prayed for the Roman emperor. The Apostle Paul did not unify with the emperor's godly agenda, unquote. <laughs> Come on. Come on, Along man. the same lines of thought as Dr. Scott Anyall in a tweet dated November 21st, 2020, a good friend whose name you mentioned early, earlier, Dr. Owen Strayan, of Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, said this, quote, unbelieving worldviews aren't, quote, neutral, unquote. Unbelief is blasphemous, perverse, personally ruinous, and leads to eternal judgment. Thus, Christianity doesn't begin with its closeness to worldly thinking. It begins with the absolute ethical antithesis between Christ and every culture. Come Mm -hmm. on, man. Come on, man. Now, I appreciate what Dr. Aniol and Dr. Strayan are saying. Because the comments help to underscore a very important point that I endeavored to make earlier in this episode, Omaha, namely that the gospel is a worldview that draws a line. The gospel draws a hard line, a firm line. You mm-hmm. see, Omaha, too many professing believers today have the idea that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a message of rainbows and rose petals as opposed to nails and crosses. Jesus, let me, let me just remind our listeners, Jesus was murdered on a cross, okay? He bled to death. Jesus didn't die in his sleep while relaxing in a lazy boy recliner. (laughs) He was nailed to a cross for witnessing to the truth. And those who profess to follow him should be willing to do the same, to bear their own cross and not acquiesce to a culture and a society for the sake of a, quote, unity, unquote, that doesn't reflect the truth for which Christ died. Mm. And a quote once more from D. Martin Lloyd-Jones from his book, The Basis of Christian Unity, quote, Modern new teaching about unity has departed so far from the New Testament that it dislikes any polemical element at all in the preaching and teaching of the truth. The man who is admired is the man who says, I am not a controversialist. I am simply a preacher of the gospel. Some evangelists and others who are evangelical in their own views are praised by those who are very liberal in their theology on the grounds that they do not, quote, attack, unquote, liberalism and modernism. That is what is admired. Any polemical element is regarded as a negation of the Christian spirit. We must expose and denounce error and not be men-pleasers only, mm-hmm. unquote. Mm-hmm. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones from The Basis of Christian Unity. Now, I'm going to keep it real with you, Omaha, as if I would do anything else. 
But when you scan the landscape of what passes for evangelical Christianity today, particularly in America, many pulpits are populated with applause-pursuing man-pleasers as opposed to holiness-pursuing God-pleasers. Oh, my word. Hold up. Back up to Hammond B3. Let's get that fired up real quick. And and that was so nice. You're going to have to say that section twice. My, my pleasure. I don't mind at all. When you scan the landscape, <laughs> When you land the landscape, landscape of what passes for evangelical Christianity today, particularly in America, many pulpits are populated with applause-pursuing man-pleasers as opposed to holiness-pursuing God-pleasers. They're, quote, worship services, unquote, if you can call them that, right. are catered to the superficial and worldly tastes, whims, and felt needs of people out of a desire to bolster their numbers and not from a desire to do what honors and magnifies God. Their, 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 their true heart's desire, their true heart's desire, if they were honest, is to exalt themselves in the eyes of the world so that they are celebrated and affirmed by the culture rather than by God himself. And the reason is, the reason they do that is that they're cowards. They're cowards. They're not willing to pay the price for carrying a cross, a price which, in many instances, means anonymity and insignificance for them in the eyes of the world. So they're not willing to pay that price. That's why I call them cowards. They're neither content nor willing to wait for God to reward them in heaven. So they seek their reward in the here and now, which more often than not consists of the temporal and passing adulation, commendation, and ego stroking of the world. Consequently, they call for unity under the false pretense that Christians are to remain silent in the face of that which is abjectly and objectly evil in society and to sell themselves in exchange for the mirage of a false peace that is a mile wide and an inch deep. Okay, you okay? got to stop. You have to stop. Holy cow. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, oh my word oh my word I, I i don't even i'm i'm jaw drop like i i don't <laughs> oh my god yeah 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 the, yeah the head the head has exploded for sure <laughs> yeah we might need Dude. to unplug the hammer for a minute unplug the hammer yeah, for a minute. yeah you got you you <clears throat> Can you please, can you please, I, I need you to go back. I, I really do. What you just said is the exclamation point. It is the mic drop. It it summarizes everything. I don't even know. I, I haven't, I, I don't have a timer. I can't tell you how long we've been on. But what you just said in this section summarizes every point that we've been making in one succinct like four or five sentence deal. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the Hammond B3 is actually on fire. It's, 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 it's in flames. I want you to go back and walk us through what you just said because what you just said is such a crystal clear prophetic, and what I mean by that is a clarity of truth telling about where we are in current culture that needs to be heard again. Please, please walk us back through that. Gladly. Now, I'm, matter of fact, I'm going to ask Dwayne, our executive producer, to go out to Amazon.com and just go ahead and order another B3. Get another B3 <laughs> in here because I think that one, I think we just that blew that gone. one out. That one's gone. Yeah. I'll, I'll gone. be glad to repeat that. I said yeah. when, you scan, when you scan the landscape of what passes, right, what passes for evangelical Christianity today, particularly in America, many pulpits are populated with applause-pursuing man-pleasers as opposed to holiness-pursuing God-pleasers. They're, they're, quote, worship services, unquote, if you could even call them that, are catered to the superficial and worldly tastes, whims, and felt needs of people out of a desire to bolster their numbers and not from a desire to do what honors and magnifies God. Their true heart's desire, if, they, if, if, these, if these evangelical pastors and leaders were honest, Omaha, their true heart's desire is to exalt themselves in the eyes of the world so that they are celebrated and affirmed by the culture rather than by God himself. And the reason is, the reason they do that is that they're cowards. They're not willing to pay the price for carrying a cross, a price which in many instances means total anonymity 
and total insignificance for them in the eyes of the world. But they can't live with that. They can't live and, and uh, without recognition and, and accolades. They're neither content nor willing to wait for God to reward them in heaven. So they seek their reward in the here and now, which more often than not consists of the temporal and passing adulation, commendation, and ego stroking of the world. Consequently, they call for, quote, unity, unquote, under the false pretense that Christians are to remain silent in the face of that which is abjectly and objectively evil in society and sell ourselves in exchange for the mirage of a false peace that is a mile wide and an inch deep. Now, I say that in light of what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Paul says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Now, the word expose in Ephesians 5.11 is the Greek verb elekho, elekho. It's spelled L-E-L-E, sorry, E-L-E-G-C-H-O, E-L-E-G-C-H-O, which translated literally means to bring to light by conviction, to find fault with toward the goal of correction, to show one his faults and demand an explanation so that he or she can be held accountable for their error. That's what that uh, word expose means in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Jesus uses that very same Greek word in John chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, where he says, this is the judgment, the light, that, I'm sorry, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be elekho, exposed. Jesus used that ex exact same Greek word in John 5 as what Paul uses in Ephesians 5. So this is against the backdrop of the two texts that I just exposited in Ephesians 5.11 and John 5 verses 19 and 20, Omaha, that I think it needs to be said and emphasized again that Christianity is not some passive belief system that calls believers to lock arms with individuals, including pastors, preachers, and politicians who subscribe to a worldview that is objectively and observable, objectively observable as being evil and which loves and promotes the darkness rather than the light. You see, Omaha, as it relates to this matter of unity, an important question professing Christians have to ask themselves is this, why am I a Christian at all? Why am I a Christian at all? Now, I'm not asking that question in the context of God's sovereign and monergistic work in bringing a person to faith in Christ, such as what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. That's not the context in which I'm asking the question. It is not in a soteriological sense that I pose that question. The question I'm urging professing believers to ask themselves is, why do you even bother? to profess to believe in Jesus Christ and in his gospel when you know in your heart that you have absolutely no desire to live your life in accordance with what Jesus and his gospel teaches. Why do you even bother? Why do you even bother? Why do you make pretense to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ, when you know in your heart that you do not view him or his word as being authoritative in your life? I could pose that same question to husbands and wives who profess to be believers in Jesus, but who have not submitted their hearts to the will of God as it relates to God's command that husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. That's Ephesians 5.25. And conversely, to his commands that wives respect their husbands. That's Ephesians 5.33b. What I'm alluding to here, Omaha, is a reality that few people who profess, who profess to believe in Jesus Christ want to face about themselves that the kind of Christianity they actually prefer is one that is filled with loopholes, asterisks, and fine print that affords them the luxury and the comfort of being able to pick and choose not only what kind of cross they will bear, if any, but when they will bear it, how long they will bear it, and how many nails, or perhaps better, how many thumbtacks they'll be subjected to, if any at all. Now, that kind of crossless Christianity is what I call cafeteria Christianity. It's a Christianity that is a, that's a la carte. It's where you view your life as if it were one huge cafeteria that you just casually meander through and where you can pick and choose and, uh, to apply to your life those principles, those precepts, 
and those commands of Jesus and his gospel that meet with your tastes, your appetites, and your comfort level while disregarding and ignoring the things you are uncomfortable with. That's what I mean by cafeteria Christianity. That the church is filled with cafeteria Christians brings to mind these pointed words from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who in his sermons titled The Lion's Den said this, quote, there is toleration for everybody who conforms to the fashion of the day, but no toleration for anyone who believes that the laws of heaven should regulate life on earth, unquote. That was Charles Spurgeon from The Lion's Den. Now let us consider those words from Spurgeon in light of what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 24. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, I want to park for a few moments, Omaha, on that phrase, come after, because there's a lot there that is of value for us to unpack. Now, it should be noted that the phrase come after is formed from two separate Greek words, okay? The word come is the Greek word erkomai, erkomai, E-R-C-H-O-M-A-I, erkomai, which translated means to come from one place to another, okay? That's what the word come means in the Greek in Matthew 16, 24. Now consider that definition in view of Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, which reads, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, but see, here's where the significance of that second Greek word comes in, the word after. The word after is the Greek ad adverb opiso, opiso, that's O-P-I-S-O, opiso, which translated is speaking of places, people, and things that one leaves behind, okay? So when we look at what it means for a person to come after Jesus, we understand that it means not only to follow him in obedience, to come from one place to another, but to do so in such a way that you leave behind the kind of life, the way of thinking and living that you were called out of. Okay, a good textual example of that is in Luke chapter 5, verse 11, where it says of the first disciples that Jesus called, Simon, Simon Peter, James, and John, that when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. It's Luke 5, verse 11. Now, notice also in Matthew 16, 24, what Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and choose his cross and follow me. That's not what Jesus said. That Jesus said you must take up your cross implies that a cross has already been chosen for you by Jesus himself. Your cross is not chosen by you. Your job is to take up the cross that has been providentially and sovereignly chosen for you by the Lord and to carry it for however long God would have you to do so, trusting that by the power of his spirit, you will be granted the strength to bear up under it. Now, I say that because more often than not, to carry a cross means standing courageously and boldly against the world, not uniting with it. As Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, quote, the weakest of minds are those which go forward because they are borne along by the throng. But the truly strong are accustomed to standing alone and are not cast down if they find themselves in a minority, unquote. Thoughts, Omaha? I mean, a th th lot of thoughts. You walk through a ton of material. And again, I, I really encourage our listeners, man, to go back through and I mean, there are two facets of the commentary that you just laid out for us. Uh, one was was what I what I call you, you operating in in, in in that prophetic gifting, and and what I don't mean by, by let me start out what I don't mean by that. What I don't mean <laughs> <laughs> what I don't mean by that is seeing into the future and, and coming up with something, but 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 speaking boldly and plainly with truthfulness about the given condition our given situation in ways that not many men speak. I, I think that's one of the reasons why, I mean, as you and I have traveled, we've had numbers of people who've come up to us, a number of people who've come up to us and said, man, one, I thought I was going crazy. Uh, as, as they're, as they're listening to the culture, as they're listening to what, what, what culturally evangelicals or campfire Christians and all these, all these kind of labels that we've placed have been saying to them, 
they, they they're thinking they're going crazy. I mean, we uh, I would love to say that I'm I'm overstating this. Yeah. That 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 I'm 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 hyping things up to get you to, th- to get you to listen to just thinking. That is not what's happening. People are literally listening to to the culture. They're listening to cultural Christianity. They're listening to these campfire Christians. They're listening to 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 these progressive evangelicals and and sheep, true followers of Christ, are coming to the conclusion that they've they've lost their mind or they've lost their way mm-hmm. or or something's wrong with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and and when we run into them, that's that's what they're telling us. And so it's important that when we sit down to record these these episodes that we speak truth with clarity. Yes. And in this previous section, that's exactly uh, what my brother Daryl just did and, and just a brilliant way. And then secondarily, um, he then walks you through the text of scripture and shows you how, how he validated everything that, that he said by what scripture has to say about it. I mean, to, to, for him to, to unpack Matthew 16, 24, and let you know that that to come translates to to come from one place to another, and and that we're going to leave something behind as a result, as we carry our cross and follow Christ is is reality. He, here again, that's just a summary of the ground you covered and and its importance. And again, I share this at the back end of what of what we're going to talk about for the purpose of of of, of making sure that that you don't just listen to the Just Thinking podcast once, right? That, that you grab a pen and some paper and sit down and really unpack what's there because there's a lot that there's a reason why we don't, we don't have a, a, a weekly episode as right. much as we would love to. Right. Um, the, the amount of time it requires to go back through and, and unpack what you just heard, the stuff that I've put together, the research, for, uh, my, the, 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 and again, I don't say this to brag. I, I say this so that you can understand the, the opening monologue that, that I, that I shared that took me three hours of study to go back and connect all the dots of the of that stuff. Yep. Right. And and, and again, yep. we we do we do that f- for the purpose of you being armed and equipped. Let me say this, and and I'll wrap up my my comments here. We, we live in a culture that loves to read about martyrs, mm. but never to live a life worthy of martyrdom. Man, whoa, 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 whoa! Hold on a second. Hold on a second, bro. That was so nice. I'm going to have to push rewind. <laughs> and have you say that twice, bro. I just, I, I'm thinking about what, what you just, what you just shared and in, in all of that. And, and the, the matter, these, these man pleasers, these, these, these folks who are, who are looking for uh, worldly, worldly man pleasing, all the things that you mentioned. And, and I, and I came to the statement and I just said, we live in a culture loves to read about the martyrs, but never to live a life uh, worthy of martyrdom. Man, bro. Man, I so appreciate that, Omaha. You know, as we prepare to close out this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast on an exposition of biblical unity. See, this is what this there's there's a reason why we titled it an exposition mm. of biblical unity. You just alluded to it, Omaha. See, there's this reason why we don't come out with we get asked all the time. Why don't you guys just just do weekly? Ep- Can you guys just do weekly episodes? That's right. not what we do here. That's not what we do here. The Just Thinking Podcast is an expositional, expo- exegetical. Uh, we call it long form. It's long form because it's expositional and exegetical. Okay, it's, it's, it's we, we don't we don't we don't we don't uh, we we didn't back our way into that uh, definition or that description of uh, what our podcast is like. That that's what we do here. That's what we do here. That's why we don't release episodes every week. We're not, we're not after the numbers. We're not after the, the popularity. I love what you just said, Omaha. You're right. We, we, we pray at the end, when we close out each of these episodes, that it leaves you, more, it leaves you better equipped. Mm-hmm. It leaves you better equipped to go out and be an apologist on these types of issues. Okay? So we, we, we pray in, our, in, in, our, in the depths of our heart that as you listen to us, that you don't consider us uh, listening to us a waste of time. Uh, and I would concur with, with Omaha, Omaha, what he said earlier. We Listen, I'm, we don't say this to brag or to boast, but, but we, we, the number of hours that we put into each episode, we put those hours in, number one, because we love the Lord, and then number two, because we love you. 
Mm-hmm. We love you. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we want you to be the best apologist you can be. Because these, these issues that we talk about, if, you've ha- if you haven't encountered them, you will. Mm-hmm. You will. Okay? So as we prepare to close out this episode, I want to leave our listeners, Omaha, with these encouraging thoughts from John Calvin, from, again, from his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Calvin said this quote. He says, God's calling serves us as a guiding principle and, and as a sound basis for all our conduct. And that whoever refuses to be guided by his calling will never keep to the right path and properly just discharge his duty. He may indeed perform an occasional act, which on the outside appears commendable, but he will not be accepted before God's throne, however much men may admire him. Furthermore, if God's calling is not to be our constant rule, there will be nothing sure which will hold excuse me, which will hold or knit together the different, the different parts of our life. Thus, whoever lives with this as his goal will lead a truly well-ordered life. All this will be a source of remarkable comfort to us, for there will be no activity, however mean or despised, which will not shine brightly in God's sight and be most precious to him, as long as in doing it, we follow our calling, unquote. That was John Calvin from his institutes. And, and what exactly is that calling of which John Calvin is speaking? Well, it is to demonstrate to an unbelieving world that though we are in this world, we are not of this world. It's John 17, 16. Consequently, any, quote, empathy, charity, and unity, unquote, to quote J.D. Greer again, that I might be compelled to display towards others is to be both grounded in and defined by Jesus Christ and his gospel, not in or by the world. Okay? The Apostle Paul makes that abundantly clear in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He says, for we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, yes, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We will walk in the works that God's prepared. Now, pair those words from uh, the Apostle Paul with these words from the Apostle John in John chapter 3, verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Believers are to walk in the world in such a way as to engage in the works that have been prepared by and wrought in God. Mm-hmm. The word wrought, the word wrought in John 3.21 is the Greek verb ergatzomai, ergatzomai, E-R-G-A-Z-O-M-A-I, ergatzomai, which means to produce or to cause to exist. Okay? My point here is that God would never prepare, produce, or cause to exist works for his people to perform that were against or were antithetical to his own nature and character. God would never do that. And for any professing believer to call for the church to, quote, unite, unquote, with the world in any way, shape, or form is to do exactly that. Now, with that thought in mind, I want to leave and I want to close with this. Excuse me. I want to leave our listeners with these words from my my dear brother, my friend, my colleague at Grace to You, Jeremiah Johnson. Jeremiah serves as the editorial manager at Grace to You, and in a blog article he wrote titled "The Gospel in a Hostile World." The Gospel in a Hostile World. Jeremiah Johnson said this quote: "Being in the world but not of it means we need to be living, breathing testimonies to God's transforming work through His Word." There needs to be a noticeable difference between us and the hell-bent world, one that draws sinners to the light of his word. But that's not possible if we aren't actually in the world. Too many believers allow their spiritual separation from the world to justify creating a physical barrier, withdrawing from society completely. But But in the process of shutting out the influences of a wicked culture, Zealous Christians forfeit their opportunities to be salt and light in that culture. That kind of pious stiff arm won't bring anyone to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, 
total separation from the world isn't an accurate portrayal of our Lord who crossed a much wider spiritual chasm to die on our behalf. In light of Christ's example, we must be willing to reach out to sinners with the good news of his life and sacrificial death. However, too great a separation isn't the only pitfall for believers when it comes to being in the world but not of it. While many Christians cut off avenues of gospel ministry by pulling away from the world, many others tarnish the testimony of the gospel through their careless dalliances with the world. Unquote. That was Jeremiah Johnson from his blog post, The Gospel in a Hostile World. We're going to link to that blog post in the episode notes, so be sure to look for that. Omaha, any thoughts from you, my friend, uh, uh, before you close us in prayer as we wrap up this episode of the Just Thinking Podcast on a biblical exposition, an exposition of biblical unity? Uh, I think I think we cover the ground top to bottom, man, like we always do on our episodes. And um, just by way of reminder about AGTV to, to check us out there, I'm sure this episode will be be posted there before long. If and uh, go to watch AGTV dot com and uh, and we've had this. This will be it for us, I think, for the year. You tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, yeah, Darryl, this is our this is our final scheduled. Uh, episode anyway. Our final right. scheduled episode is this episode here. So this episode is scheduled to drop on December the 9th, 2020. Mm-hmm. So this will this is our final scheduled episode for 2020. Yeah. And so we'll we'll pick things back up in the new year. In the meantime, if you're listening to this and you're still uh, wanting to hear great content, we're going to encourage you to go back and listen to the library of episodes that we have uh, there, justthinking.me, uh, or wherever you download things on, on whether it's Spotify, whether it's uh, um, Apple, iTunes, <clears throat> wherever you get your podcast. We want to encourage you to go back and, and take a listen to that. Be praying for us as we go into uh, this brand new year and a meeting with our team and what's what lies ahead and what all we're going to be doing for 2021. We got a lot of things that that uh, a lot of places and spaces where we're going to be, where we're scheduled to be doing speaking and the like. And uh, Daryl and I are, are excited to, to be in, in those places, but we'll also be talking about uh, how to promote things moving forward. I want to encourage you, if you feel so inclined uh, and, and would like to partner with us to do so, you can go to, uh, to, to the justthinking.me, uh, justthinking.me website. I think it's forward slash give and, ch- and check us out uh, there. If, you, if you'd like to, like to support us in any way, shape, or form, we would definitely greatly appreciate that as you're thinking about year-end giving uh, and the like. Anything else I didn't cover? Any ground I didn't cover? I think, you probably, I think you covered it all, bro. You might close us out in prayer. Let's do it, man. Father God, we just give you thanks and praise. We glorify your name. We're grateful uh, for the sacrifice of your son, uh, for the redeeming of, of a people unto yourself. And uh, we're grateful for the, the message of the gospel that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling hearts to you. And so it, it is with that in mind that, that we call not, not to, to, to have us unify with the world. For those who would, who would try to unify us with the world, we reject that. And, uh, and, and what we do is we, we hold fast and tightly and closely uh, to your truth, to the truth of your word, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, which calls us to unify to you. And that in that unity with you, according to Ephesians 3, one with another. We pray for those who we mentioned here from every uh, that was mentioned, every every person uh, that was mentioned that may be appealing to some other form of unity. We, we ask you by your spirit to, to jar their hearts, their thoughts, their minds, convict them by, by, the, very, by the very words of, that, that they hear, whether it be from here, or from us, or through some other resource, uh, that they align themselves with the truth of your word uh, and, th- and that they stay conformed into the image of your son as they point others into that space. I give thanks and praise for all that you've allowed us to do on this platform. Uh, we, we ask you to use it uh, to glorify yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, bro. All right. Thank you, listeners, for hanging us hanging in there with us for 2020. We'll see you on the other side, Lord willing, in 2021. God bless. The Just Thinking Podcast, hosted by Daryl Harrison and Virgil Walker, is a Christ-centered, gospel-focused, and theologically challenging program that boldly and unapologetically addresses social, political, and cultural issues from a biblical worldview. With an international listenership that stretches from the United States and Canada to Romania, Nicaragua, and Mongolia, 
The Just Thinking Podcast breaks through all ethnic, geographic, social, and cultural barriers to bring the objective truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the issues confronting his church and his people. Subscribe to the Just Thinking Podcast using the podcast app on your Apple or Android smart device, or you can listen online at thebarpodcast.com slash JT.